I will call this special meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council to order. Today is Thursday, February 21st. Our focus is going to be our budget season. And Madam Clerk, will you take the roll, please? Yes. Councilmember Dominguez? Here. Councilmember Hardy? Here. Councilmember Coop? Here. Mayor Maria? Here. Councilmember Ruff? Here. Councilmember Sin? Here. Councilmember Gutierrez? Here. Great. So this is uh, Councilmember Harmon's first meeting. We're pleased to have her. And um, we're not microphone today. So everybody, you need to project from your diaphragm so everybody can hear you in the back. And we have public comment that's not on our agenda. And that would be Roseanne Crawford today. Does someone have a timer real handy for Mr. Do I just please hear from my chair? Um, maybe, oh, let's see, we have a camera today. So right there, right there. that looks like a, exactly. that looks like a perfect spot. Okay. Let me know when you're ready. I mean, I, I got it. Go. Hi, I'm Roseanne Crawford. Uh, I'm the originator of the MoveOn.org petition Save the Historic Mission Creek Bridge. And I'm going to be very brief. I've given all of you a handout that was passed out at the commission meeting when it went into the capital budget. And I just want to voice we are firmly against this project. And uh, in this uh, budget cycle, there is nothing listed in the 2019-20 year. And I'm hoping that this isn't going to come across the table today. We'll be watching for that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Crawford. And we have a public comment slip for our budget. Mr. Sheck, are you ready to I make am. a statement? I am ready to Madam Mayor. Uh, Mayor Murillo and Council, my name is Daryl Sheck, uh, field representative for SEIU Local 620. Uh, we represent many of your fine city employees in the general unit, uh, the treatment unit, treatment and patrol unit, and also part-time employees. Um, I'm here today to listen to city staff's presentation regarding the development of the fiscal year 2020 budget. Um, I'm also here to ask the council and staff not forget about the value contributions of the employees we represent in developing the new budget. Um, those we represent, uh, or those, those we represent, deal every day with the reality that Santa Barbara is one of the most unaffordable metropolitan areas in California, if not the country we live in. We're asking that council and staff recognize this and include planning for inflation that will allow those we represent, at the very least, to maintain and hopefully improve their standard of living. And I would like to pass out um, just one sheet to each council member. And do you have an extra for the clerk so I it do can be one. part of the record? Thank you, Mayor. Ms. Crawford, did you give the clerk your handout to Yes, one? I have one. You go, okay, she's gone. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. So I've provided information from the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics regarding the consumer price index for all urban consumers in the Los Angeles metropolitan area and the San Francisco metropolitan area. As you can see, inflation steadily advanced over the last four years. Inflation erodes into our members' ability to pay for everyday living expenses. And annually, for 2018, this inflation rate ran at a rate of over 3.8% in San Francisco and Los Angeles. Those we represent are a large part in the city's current and continued success. We urge you through this process to also make plans to take care of your valued employees by recognizing the increased everyday costs your workforce has to deal with every day. And with that information, I just wanted to say thank you for your time. We hope this process is more productive for those we represent than the process in recent years. We understand there are a lot of priorities the city must consider, and I don't envy your job. Um, please consider making your workforce more of a priority in this process. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to the presentation. Thank you, thank you for being here. That closes our public comment. Madam Clerk, item number two. <coughs> item two, budget work session for fiscal year 2020. Mr. Casey, you're starting this off, I think. Yes. Madam Mayor, Council members, welcome. Um, you know, Bob and I are excited. This is a budget work session. You know, we, we, we like this. Uh, <laughs> this is officially the kickoff to your budget season. And so we do this every year uh, at this part of the budget cycle just to kind of get your head in the game. Uh, Bob's going to give a pretty extensive overview of our finances, both the general fund and then a little bit more briefly on the enterprise funds. 
and go through a lot of numbers and a lot of projections and see assumptions that we're putting into our revenue uh, projections and that sort of stuff and give you an overall picture of what kind of budget outlook we're looking at. Uh, as you know, the charter requires me to submit you a proposed budget in early April, and then you have a number of meetings to go through uh, that before you adopt a budget in late June. So today is teeing it up, uh, going through the issues, ask questions, kick the tires on the assumptions and stuff. After Bob, I will follow through with a, a brief, but kind of a good overview of all the workload that we're working on to make sure we're kind of hitting your priorities. In that regard, I'll walk you through a handout of that. Happy to take any input and guidance that you all might have or areas you might be wanting to pursue as part of this budget cycle. It's a workshop, so we're not looking for any formal action today. Uh, you're not able to take any formal action today, uh, but it is kind of the start of a four-month process, so there's plenty of time to kind of effectuate change as we go through the budget cycle. <coughs> so with that, if you don't have any preliminary questions, I'll turn it over to Bob. And Paul, I, I want to make a process a question, if I might, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, Paul is quite uh, generous in how he described it, but Santa Barbara's charter is similar to many others in California. Uh, when the populist rebellion happened in the early 20th century, they modeled uh, California cities after a corporate model where you'd have a strong CEO. Uh, what that means is it's incumbent on Paul to use his own judgment independently of the city council to compile a budget that he believes as an apolitical administrator will serve the needs of the city as directed by the council. So technically speaking, once he hands the budget to you, it's yours to do whatever you want with. Until then, it's his decision and you technically can't direct him to include something in the budget. Obviously, he's listening, but I wanted to make that distinction because it's important to recognize that his role is totally apolitical in forming the budget, whereas yours is totally political in applying the budget. Thank you. Thank you for that. So Mr. Samario said it was okay for us to interrupt him in the middle if you really got inspired to ask a question. And Paul, I guess Mr. Casey will do the same with you. Of course. And then at the end, we'll open. I will open it up to the council to give <coughs> their opinions, and that would be the time for us to um, give our feedback. Please go ahead. Right. Thank you, Mayor, Welcome, Council members. And I'm going to try to project. I've got something going on in my ears. I have a hard time sensing how loud I'm speaking, but I'll try to speak up so far. Yeah, a little louder. A little louder, okay. So as Paul indicated, I'm going to provide you a really high-level overview of the city's finances and some of the things that we're kind of looking at in terms of what's it looking like for the next couple of years. But I'm going to start with what I typically do is kind of the understanding of the city's financial structure because we're a complex organization. We have a lot of different things that go on. And it's helpful, I think, from a budgetary perspective to understand how we're organized financially and budgetarily. I'm going to spend some time on enterprise funds, but the focus will be, of course, on the general fund. And then we'll spend a little bit of time on the city's retirement program, what's going on. You've been hearing a lot of the news about the, the state of the, the retirement system in California. Get into multi-year forecasts, kind of this is the outlook, what is it looking like for the next few years. Um, and then I'll turn over to Paul for the major projects and initiatives, and we'll close with the budget calendar. So understanding city finances. So just kind of by way of perspective, you think about the private sector. The private sector is fairly straightforward and they have one operation, one set of books, their assets and liabilities, revenues, expenses that they're tracking. We're much different than that, particularly because we're a complex organization. We have many different funds and op operations and activities that we track for track separately. And we track them separately in what we call a fund. And each of those funds, we can maintain this whole set of books. So every single fund that we have has its own assets, liability, and revenue expenditures. So it's, it's a lot of work for us to track it all, but it just speaks to the complexity of, of the city of Santa Barbara. And fund accounting, this, these silos, if you will, is something that is required by all levels of government, from federal to state, county to cities. And in fact, even the financial reporting that we do, you've all heard of the term CAF or Comprehensive Financial Report. That looks exactly the same whether you're looking at the state of California's capper, a county capper, or a city capper, because they wanted to standardize that. And it's really designed to, to demonstrate that even financial reporting, designed to demonstrate compliance with a lot of restrictions on city funds. 
And the whole idea of funded counting really was born out of the turn of the century, the last century, the early 1900s, where there was a lot of misuse of funds. There would be a tax increase, and it would get commingled with their general fund or, or new checking account, and it would lose its identity, and it made it difficult for accountability, and well, frankly, there was probably a lot of corruption going on as well. So with fund accounting funds, it makes that process a lot easier for us to demonstrate that we are using the money as intended. So the types of fund type, the types of funds that we're used here in the city, and these are not unique to Santa Barbara. These are the types of funds that every organization will use, depending on how complex they are. The bottom right is the general fund. We only have one of those funds that every city in, in the state, if they have no other fund, they're going to have a general fund. That's really the primary operation uh, operating fund. And then top left, you see we have enterprise funds making up about 40%. We have seven enterprise funds. And then below that, what we call special revenue funds, and I'll talk about them in a moment, but there's 14 of those, and then seven internal service funds. So we have a lot of funds, and these are the ones that are just budgeted. We have a lot of funds that trust and agency, <laughs> agency funds that we don't budget. We probably have close to 60 different funds that we track for, in terms of activities. So the general fund, I mentioned, is it's the primary operating fund of every government. And what's it's used to it used to tell us that it accounts for everything um, that's not accounted for or required to be accounted for somewhere else. It's really used to account for the services that have a general benefit to the community, such as police, fire, libraries, and recreation, those things that really have this general benefit. And they are, because of that, they're primarily funded from taxes. And the, the unique thing about taxes, if you think about it, unlike water, for example, is taxes, there's no nexus between what you pay and what services you receive. That's the nature of how those things are funded. Libraries, uh, you may never to go to a city library, but you're still going to pay the property taxes. So that's the idea. It's considered a general benefit to the community. It also accounts for other services that are primarily funded from taxes, but have some fees associated with them, like plan check, recreation classes, and so forth. So there are some fees that we charge for the non-general benefit services that are more discretionary, uh, but they're still highly subsidized to varying degrees. The enterprise funds, uh, they are primarily funded from user fees, so unlike the general fund, there's no tax support. And again, unlike the general fund and the taxes and how they're funding services, there is this direct relationship between what you pay and what you're receiving. So let's think of a water bill. You're only going to pay for the water you consume, no more, no less. And the revenues in these enterprise funds are generally restricted to those activities, there's some exceptions. But for sure, the utility funds are all restricted. You know, in the past, this became a hot topic conversation because we were asked during the last recession, the major recession, why can't we take money from the water fund or the downtown parking fund or from the other funds? And largely speaking, those funds are restricted. We can't move money from those funds to the general fund to help out. The exceptions are downtown parking and golf fund. Those funds are technically unrestricted. They're not subject to any federal or state laws in terms of how we're, in terms of restrictions. We could just as easily move it into the general fund, but we don't, but we can keep Professor Fashion that way. Internal service funds, those are funds that are, are established for centralized services like motor pool, facilities, and those things. It's just easier for us to track them in one place, and we charge out those services to the individual funds and departments, and we call these allocated costs, but those are the costs that are being charged for IT, information technology, and so forth. And again, organization more efficient for us to do it that way than having all these Every single department and fund manage their own IT, their own facilities, their own um, vehicles. The special revenue funds are used to account for restric restricted funds for a specific purpose. For example, Creek's Water Quality Improvement Fund, that's Measure B, those are restricted monies to be calculated separately in a special revenue fund. The CBG Grant Fund, our Measure A, or Transportation Sales Tax Fund, that's the half cent county <coughs> measure. And then Measure C is not accounted for as a special revenue fund because you may recall it was a general tax, not a special tax. So we account for it in a, in, in a non-special revenue fund associated with the general fund. But we do a lot to, to ensure that it's being spent as intended. So I want to go through each of the enterprise funds quickly. You get a sense of kind of, particularly for new council members, you know, get you familiar with what they do and what's, the, the, what's looking like the next couple of years. The airport fund, you know, you think about it, they're really in the, largely in the property management business. One of the key tenants happens to be these airlines. Um, but there, there are two areas in the airport. One is the, what we call the aviation area, which is south of Hollister. So you're driving Hollister toward Goleta on the left side toward the beach is the aviation part of the airport. 
on the north side, on the right side of Hollister, is the non-aviation or commercial industrial area. And that commercial industrial area, while not related to aviation, brings in a fair amount of revenues to the airport to fund its operations. So the airlines, how they're funded for the airlines, you see the landing fees, float, float, fuel load fees, terminal space rent, and then there's concessions, and then I mentioned the non-aviation stuff, all the long-term building leases um, in the commercial industrial area. They have a pretty substantial capital program funded largely by FAA, the FAA. Uh, there's an entitlement component and a discretionary component as funds are available, all restricted for capital improvements for runways and common areas, not revenue producing areas. Um, but there is a condition on these FAA grants that we cannot take revenues from the general operations of the airport and use it for non-airport purposes. That's one of the restrictions we talked about, that you can't take airport money and move it into the general fund to help some of those issues. The water fund is the second largest fund in the city. It's at $65 million this year. Next year, it's going to be probably close to or even above $100 million, largely due to the big capital projects they've got planned for next year, in the next couple of years. Um, their capital program will probably exceed $50 million next year, so it's a pretty big number. One of the big projects is the modifications to the desal plant in order to serve Montecito as a connection with agreement with them that we're working on. Building a conveyance pipeline that will enable us to tap in from from desal to cater, so we can provide water to the higher zone areas as well as Montecito. Fortunately, they, the water fund has a fair amount of reserves uh, above policy, um, and so they're gonna be able to cash fund some of these big capital projects instead of having to borrow from either the state or otherwise. Supply management, as you know, is a critical element of what they do. It's really what makes that, that fund and operation very complex. It's, it's you know, science and art. Um, and as with the recent storms and rains, Kachuma is, I don't know, what's that, 55 or so, maybe even higher than that. That's going to require some reevaluation of our, our supply management plan in the next few years. And then the rate setting for water, and you'll see that for other utilities, is really heavily controlled by what's referred to as Proposition 218, passed in 1996, which makes it very, it imposes on us a requirement that as the, what we charge to individual customers is really, really directly tied to what they receive in certain services. We can't make these sort of broad rates that, you know, that, are, that potentially could be subsidizing individuals or classes. Um, so a big part of what we do, every year we do a rate study to make sure that the cost of services is appropriate. Same with wastewater. I, I see it as very similar to, to, waste, to the water fund in that they are controlled by Prop 218, but just like the water, they're really focusing a lot on the aging infrastructure it's all critical infrastructure to make sure water, you know, to get to the treatment plant and we don't have overflows and those kinds of things. But they're much less complex. They don't have that supply management issue of the water. The wastewater just comes to them naturally. And their budget is about half of that, or less than half of the water fund, which kind of evidences its less complex nature. Their major focus of operations will be continued investment in facilities um, to deal with state and federal state treatment standards. Um, I mean, essentially, as when I talked to Rebecca, what they're doing is really rebuilding the facilities for the future generations. They're very old facilities. Um, the next five to 10 years, the rate setting process, we kind of have a sense of what we need for capital. And typically, we look at a three or 4% for CPI, but it's gonna be more than five to 6% range because of the capital needs over the five, 10 years. And, and what's different about wastewater than water is that it's, your wastewater bill is tied to your water bill that is capped. So at 10 units of water, you will no longer be charged for, for wastewater because the assumption for that is that it's really irrigation purposes and it's all water related. So there's a, there's a cap on that. Um, I know they're evaluating that cap whether it should be higher or lower, um, but that's where it's at now. But because of that cap, the revenues are much more stable than we'll see in the water plant. Saw Waste Fund, my favorite fund in the city, because it's under my operation. Its activities are largely uh, dictated by state regulation. So the mand mandatory requirements for recycling, diversion, and getting organics out of the landfill, those are all things that are driving us and the county to make sure that we're getting there. It's a big, if you look at the Saw Waste Fund, it's a $28 million budget, so a really big budget, but really most of it goes toward, it's passed through to Marburg for collection services about. 62% of that is just for Marburg, uh, for the services they do for collection and transport of, of all the materials to the, to the county transfer station. 
tipping fees uh, for processing about 28%. That number will grow because of the resource recovery project. With the new facility we built, it's going to be tipping fees become a bigger portion of our overall rates. And then the solid waste programs, uh, that's about 10%. That's our staff doing education outreach and implementing new programs that we saw recently with the straws and plastic bags and stuff. I mentioned Marburg is our contract hauler. We're in year six of a 10-year franchise agreement, so in a couple of years we'll probably start looking at starting renegotiations of that. And as I mentioned, the TRP, the, the Tahigos Resource Recovery Project, is now under construction. I think they're planning a, a ribbon cutting soon. But because of that, and the bond financing associated with that, this next year we're going to see a pretty substantial rate increase in around 16% for, for trash, in addition to what happens to water and water. The Gulf Fund, um, not required to be an enterprise fund, as I mentioned before, um, but having, having it as an enterprise fund helps ensure that it's self-sustaining so that the fees are covered all of their costs. Their total revenues are about $3 million per year, most of that for green fees. They've taken over the carts, so it used to be owned and operated by the, the pro, but we, we do that now, so it brings in about 17% of the revenues. I alluded to this a couple of years ago. A few years ago, we shifted from um, having a pro and city kind of run operations to now a contract operator who also takes care of the maintenance of the, of the golf course. Um, customer service has improved. Um, we're seeing um, revenues kind of stabilize, so we're hoping that's going to continue to either be stable or grow. They did struggle for a number of years before that financially just because of national trends in golf. Um, Play just has gone had gone down. It seems to have stable, stabilized now. Um, we're hoping with a better <coughs> product, you know, looking better, uh, and with better customer service, we're able to bring more people to golf. Feel free to ask questions along the way. I'm going to move through this fairly quickly. Uh, the waterfront fund, I think, is a fairly interesting fund because of what it encompasses. So we think of the waterfront as sort of the whole beach area, but it really consists of really two two elements or two components: the city property and then the Thailands that are owned by the state. So when you talk about the Thailands, what we're talking about is from the, the mean tide along the shore, three and a half mile over the ocean. And we have essentially managed that on behalf of the state uh, under a trust. Every city that's on along the coast, whether it be Long Beach or San Diego that has a harbor, they have to manage those Thailands in pursuant to a trust agreement. Ours was executed initially back in 1925. And that trust agreement requires that we establish and operate a harbor, a wharf, docks, piers, slips, etc., and that it may be maintained for public pur purposes, not private for public purposes. The city land includes the streets and sidewalks, as you know, maintenance, and which is maintained by public works. The parks and beaches are maintained by parks and recreation. The recreation facilities, like this building here, is maintained and operated by parks and rec. And then the parking lots, um, like the harbor and marina, and, and, and all the buildings are operated and maintained by the, by the waterfront department. And like the airport, they're sensing the property management business. You can see the large, most of the revenues come from leases, building leases. Um, that's 66% of the total revenues are from lease of facilities like uh, where Brophy Brothers is, uh, and Chuck's Waterfront Grill, and so forth. But a lot of their time and effort is maintaining those facilities, making, keeping them up to snuff, um, and then managing <coughs> the parking lots and surface, maintaining the surface parking lots, and that brings in about 20% of the revenues. Downtown Parking Fund, they maintain five parking structures and ten surface lots. Doesn't include the, the parking lot at the San Diego, that's privately owned and operated and all that. Um, but that basically, they manage all the parking lots except for those that are in the waterfront. Not required to be an enterprise fund, and um, so therefore its revenues are not restricted. Their only restriction is, and I'm not even sure, they're not even restricted to Prop 26, which means you have to make sure your, your revenues are tied to cost or fees, but no more than your cost, because it's the, it's the use of a public facility, they're not even restricted to that. Their revenues are unstable. They, for a while they were growing, but they really stabilized. They get about $5.39 alone just coming from the hourly parking, all the structures and the service lots. They have about four and a half million transactions per year. About 38 percent of them are paid, and 62 percent are unpaid. We have that 75-minute free period, so the majority of the transactions that occur, the four and a half million, are unpaid because they're within the 75-minute free, uh, free period. They have what's called a public benefit improvement assessment, public parking benefit improvement area, that assesses businesses 
um, ostensibly for the free period we're providing their, their customers. That brings in about a million dollars, so you can see it's well short of the of the free transactions that occur in the parking structures. The lots are relatively in good shape in terms of the maintenance. Uh, before the RDA went away back in 2013, they invested a lot of money in some of the big parking structures to, to bring them to, to, to good condition. RDA is gone, so the parking fund is going to have to figure out how to deal with that longer term. Major capital improvements. They're able to cover all the maintenance stuff, but the, the big renovations and improvements are going to come out, have to come from some other sources, not the RDA, whether bonds or building up reserves. But the reserves are good, okay now, but if we talk about the capital infrastructure they have to maintain, um, they're woefully short. Okay, any questions on that before we move on to the general fund? Okay, so Thank you. So an executive summary, before I get into some of the details, some big picture stuff, the general fund tax revenues make up about two thirds of the total overall revenues. And as we all know, we live in a tourist-based economy and, and it's good and it can be at times difficult and challenging. But because of that, our revenues are can tend to fluctuate. We saw that in 2001 and two when we had the recession which was then sort of exacerbated by the 9-11 event. Um, we saw bed, bed tax and our sales tax drop pretty substantially. The Great Recession, that was a different kind of magnitude. We saw a 16% decline in our sales tax in the three-year period. That's substantial because you, know, you kind of count on three or four percent per year. When you have this big drop, you never really recover from that. You still have not recover from that. You need 50% you know, growth in order to get back to normal. And over that time, we had a two-year drop in TOT of 11%. And in one year, we, we had to deal with a $10.5 million deficit at the time. It was a 10% reduction in staffing uh, and services. In just in one year. And in fact, we still have not gotten back to the level of services we were prior to 2008 and 2009. In 2008, we had 662 FTEs in the general fund. Today, we sit at 625. So we're still below where we were 10 years ago, 11 years ago. We're facing a new challenge, what we're going to talk about, and it has to do with sort of three parts. One is the fact that we're, we're in this seemingly this different paradigm, new world when it comes to revenues, what we can count in terms of growth, that are key revenues like debt tax and sales tax. And we're going to talk about the pension. You've been hearing about, a lot about this, what it means to us, but what it means to city statewide. Um, it's a significant impact over the next eight years or so. And then the uncertain economy. We are in the we are now in the middle of the longest expansion of recovery period in history. <coughs> We are on year 10 of recovery since the last recession, as long as we've ever seen. Typically, we see you know, post-recession recovery to be pretty strong. We've always been more moderate. Maybe that's why it's been longer. But I've mentioned that because eventually there will be a recession. I can't tell you when, but I can that there will be one, hopefully later than sooner. Um, and some are talking about some indicators now. Um, late payments on cars by, by the millennials, you know, the companies are red, is potentially a a moment or um, an indicator that maybe we're starting to see something going on in the economy. And then pension costs alone, I, I don't want to overstate it, but I mean, we are financially <coughs> strong. Pensions will impact cities statewide. There will, there will likely be some cities who will file bankruptcy. We saw it before, uh, but this is the real deal for some cities who are financially strong. Um, and this is the, the pension issue is going to hit them hard. Um, we have, you know, fortunately some time to adjust. Uh, we are still seeing some growth in revenues, so we have some time to adjust. Um, but I don't, I don't think it's going to be able to escape making some levels of cuts between now and 2022 or 23 in that time period. And because of that, for us, we have to really think about what revenue options do we have to enhance revenues that are limited. Um, so really, cost control is going to be key for us and other cities. So I mentioned this, so where the money comes from, general funds, I said earlier two-thirds, but I've added Measure C, that's bringing in about $22 million per year now. Um, so, so, so taxes make up a larger portion of our revenue in the general fund, 70%. It's, it's the sales taxes, Measure C, property taxes are largest, TOT or bed taxes and other taxes. I always like to mention um, that if you look at service charges, sort of at 9 o'clock on the left, 8%, those are the fees that I mentioned that are for some services in the general fund are 
are covered by fees, whether it's recreation, planning, building, and those things. But they really make up a small portion of our overall budget. So we, we always make sure to raise fees every year to keep up with the cost provided services. But the fact is, they're so largely, in most cases, subsidized that it's never going to be a big part of our overall budget. But we still raise fees every year to a percent. Um, but it's not a source for us to really solve our budget problems. Property taxes, just to tell, again, just kind of for people who aren't familiar with this, the property taxes are really controlled by Prop 13 passed in, in 1978. The way it's calculated is they, they assess 1% of the value of the, of the property, and it's not the market value. Your poor house may be worth a million dollars, but it's basically tied to what you pay for it. So you pay half a million dollars for that home, that 1% will be assessed in the half million dollars. Every year they can increase it by a CPI factor, um, or 2%, whichever is lower. But generally speaking, it's a slow moving, sort of growing revenue. The only exception is whether it's turnover properties. So if you sell your home to somebody else and it's worth a million, now they're going to be assessed at a million instead of you at half a million dollars. So turnover obviously brings in more revenue. Now, the other exception is when we had the recession in 2008, it was real estate driven, assessed values went down, and the county um, unilaterally decided we're going to reassess properties downward and it had an impact on the revenues. We saw them sort of flatten out, you can see growth in them. Um, but under Prop 8, we can recap, the county can recapture those, meaning they can bring them back up, not subject to this 2% CPI limit or 2% CPI. And they have been doing so, so some of our growth we're seeing in the 5 or 6 6% range is because of that recapture. How property taxes get allocated, so people think that we, you know, all the property taxes come to us, but countywide it's really split up. Largely it goes to schools, they get about 27 cents on the dollar. The county gets about 28 cents, and cities, and on average get about 13 cents on the dollar for all properties that taxes paid. I think this is just fascinating to show that so 2011, that was the last year of the, of the impact of the Great Recession that was real estate driven. We never saw a decline more than 1%, but since then, <coughs> prior to that, we were seeing the growth in the 7 to 10% per year. So one of our strongest revenues um, it's moderated, but still very strong. That in 2018, you said big bump. We had some one-time property tax revenues come in from the county. There was some uncollected amounts, backlog of collections, and then they, there was this one big case where they settled and they brought in a lot of money. So we got about $500,000 in 2018 above what our normal amounts are. So that's why it's a big number, and which is why 19 is such a small number, because we have a higher base. So we're building up a higher base, so it's 1.2. But generally speaking, we're expecting to see about a 5.5% growth um, in property taxes, which is great for us. Short-term outlook, um, CPI has been close to 2%, so we're not expecting too much beyond that, um, except for the property of recapture that I mentioned. But we are seeing the real estate values are pretty stable. Now, this is, we'll talk more about this, but next year, we're going to see new pot of money coming in to the city in property taxes. For those who remember, the redevelopment you see, as I mentioned, went away in 2013, and so they was dissolved under state law, and all the tax increment money that was going to the RDA in the $20, $22 million per year range got redistributed to all the taxing agencies in the county. So the schools got the lion's share, the, remember that time charter showed you, you got about 47%, the county got some, and we got some. But what they did was they recognized a lot of cities, a lot of RDAs had bonds that were outstanding to pay for improvements. And we had bonds outstanding um, that required about $8 million per year in debt service payment. So we continue to get $8 million uh, to pay off the debt. That debt, in fact, I just signed off the final payment on the final bonds um, with all that debt. So it's gone away, it's going away this year. So next year, that $8 million now gets redistributed to all the agencies countywide, of which we are one agency. And so we get about 13% of that, which is about $1 million. So next year, we see a bump in our property taxes. That's why you saw the 8.1 percent growth in 2020 because of the additional million dollars we get next year, and then it will just grow along with all the rest of the property taxes. Sales taxes is uh, so you can see the history: five percent, eight percent, but pretty good growth historically. If you look on the 25-year average, uh, prior to like last year. We would we could typically expect about four percent growth per year. We would always project four percent for sales taxes and six percent for rent taxes, and we were always pretty close to that. 
since the recession, we had some pretty good, pretty good years, 8, 20% in 2012. But starting in 16, we started to see things change. Um, kind of coincided with the, you know, to a large extent, the emergence of online sales and this whole new shift in consumer spending. So the last few years have been very, very big. Um, 2018 was a decline, and I'll explain that in a moment, but essentially we were underpaid in sales taxes in 2018. That's why 19 is a higher number. But generally speaking, we're still seeing around 0 to 1% growth. We're still optimistic. We think that for some reason, I'll explain in a moment, that we can get to 1.5% growth per year, but the history wouldn't tell you that, wouldn't suggest that. And the factors that are affecting the growth are, is this the shift, and it's been going on for a number of years, a shift from California to a more service-based economy. Um, on, on a per capita basis, we're really losing ground. And as you know, services aren't taxable in California. So as we move to a more service-oriented industry, we're starting to lose money. Some states will tax sales, by sales taxes to services, more discretionary services like golf, getting, you, getting your hair done, nails done, even professional services are taxed in some states. We don't do that. And they've been talking a lot about maybe trying to do some real restructuring of that, but it's very political, very difficult, very challenging because there's these winners and losers. And then I mentioned the shift in consumer spending, more toward the experiential, which you've been hearing a lot about. I always consider it, you know, sort of away from the bricks and mortar to more online stuff. And then experiential stuff, the funk zone is driving, whereas, you know, the, the retail, big retail, like big box are not. Um, so that's kind of the shift. And then the impacts of online shopping. So in state, you know, you go online to buy something, you're going to be buying from some, somebody in state or out of state. If it's in state, it's the, the whole point of sale was, it was traditionally how things get allocated has become really cloudy because you can go to Nordstrom's and look for a pair of shoes, and if they don't have your size, they'll order for you, for you online. And because you're no longer picking it up at that store, it's not being an inventory at that store, it's coming from San Bernardino, San Bernardino gets the sales tax. So it's just these weird things of rules that are in place that make it difficult for us to one project, but also there we're finding that a lot of these in-state sales or taxes are going to a small number of businesses or communities um, where they've invested in warehousing and fulfillment centers. So it's this is disproportionate shift. And um, the, the League of California Cities has assembled a group of city managers to, to assess this. Can we fix this thing that's broken? Because it's unfair that so many communities are not getting any of these tax sales taxes that it's all being lumped together. But, how do you undo that, you know, because these people have invested lots of money in these systems. So I'm not sure what's going to go on with that, but that's something we're hoping that gets cured. And then out-of-state sales, um, fortunately the, the Quill decision that was passed by the Supreme Court recently is going to cure this, but it used to be that if there were sales of out-of-state online, most of the time, unless they voluntarily complied with state law, they, you didn't get those sales taxes. So we're losing anywhere from a million to two million dollars a year because of that. The Quill decision has changed that so that now that requires, the federal court decision requires that a lot of state businesses are required to now collect sales taxes on, on behalf of the state of California. The state recently issued guidelines, established who has to report so not getting the mom and pop shops and more bigger places. Um, and that's we're looking to see, start seeing some of those revenues this coming April. So the first time in April 1 of this, of this year, we'll start seeing some of that money coming in. Good news. Good news. Yeah. And then the other thing, as I mentioned, lower than the lower than average CPI. CPI the last several years have been about two percent or below. CPI provides the price of goods and services, which affects sales taxes. We can see that lower than historical historical averages. TOT. This this was an amazing revenue for us. We we knew at some point it had to end. Just didn't know when. But starting 2011, you can see the growth we've had per year all the way to 15% in one year, 2014. The little purple box you see at the bottom, that's the, the TOT on vacation rentals. So we saw it kind of ramp up pretty quickly, and then we started enforcing it, not allowing it to run away. But the, the, the traditional hotels, they moved very, very strong. But now they're starting to taper off. Not really sure why. We think it's because maybe they've reached effective you know, maximum occupancy. Some hotels are in the 80% range, which you think of seasonal impact. That's probably as high as they're going to go. In talking to this visit center, Barbara, they're expecting that, they're suggesting to us we shouldn't expect much in the way of growth in revenues other than from price increases. We're not going to, we're not expecting any more occupancy because they just put that total mass 
couldn't remember. And then Goleta, they built new hotels and they're getting their full and they're really attracting lots of business travelers, but they're definitely impacting us because instead of coming here, they're not going there. And it's closer to the airport. <clears throat> Our utility interest tax is applied to all utilities except for wastewater. And some of you may know this, um, we get about $14 million a year in utility users taxes. Half of that goes to our streets fund. It's the, other than Measure C, utility users taxes is the largest funding source for our streets program at $7 million. The other half goes to the general fund. This was established back in the 90s by ordinance where when the, the tax was raised from 3% to 6%, the council at the time adopted an ordinance committing that extra 3% to streets. And they fulfilled that commitment. It wasn't a restriction, a legal restriction. It was just by ordinance. They can change it in Tuesday or the 38th. But they maintained that commitment, which I think sort of speaks to how we sort of see Measure C, even though it's not a restricted tax. We're going to have the same level of commitment to ensure those first trees. So 6%. We, do, we did lower it a few years ago to five and three quarters for telecommunications. Not going to get into the long story, but a lot of cities, you see the being challenged for, on the telecom side of things. So we went to the voters and said, we'd like for you to validate and confirm our tax, and they did. And as a way to sort of help get there, we lowered that tax to five and three quarters percent. So, so this is on telephone, um, video, and so forth. And when we did that, we modernized our ordinance to, to that we were technologically neutral because we're seeing shifts in how these services are being provided, electric companies providing telephone services, telephone companies provide a kid, it just, it, so, so we're saying if you provide a video, we don't care what you are in terms of an entity, you're subject to our UT, um, and, and so that was helpful for us, to make that technology neutral. <coughs> this has been the trend over, since 2011, you can see all of our UT revenues are flat, largely because of changes in technology, which I'll speak to in a moment. Other than water, which we've been having to increase for, for our own purposes, all the other sectors have been very flat in the last few years. The newest trend, I'm sure you've been hearing about this, called over-the-top television. This is where you can watch video, movies, via your internet. You no longer have relying on cable companies to provide that service. A lot of people are unplugging cable and going to just strictly internet-based video. That's what I've done. So you can get you know, TV programming, original programming, movies, Google, Netflix, Sling TV, and so forth. And as I just mentioned, all this is video. We, we said on our ordinance, it doesn't matter how you're providing video, it's still taxable for our UT. Our, all the industry has um, fought against that, said, no, we don't agree. Um, so we are working at a league level, excuse me, to a, a small working group of finance directors and finance officers to try to work with industry to get them to at least start incrementally recognizing that at least some of that is sort of clearly video services that are subject to our UT. But so, so far, nobody has been uh, collecting UT on the video, which is why we're seeing a lot of these things flatten out and lower down. And then the last one I'll mention is cannabis. Measure D, it's that it was originally a 20% tax for the ordinance, but we've lowered it to initially 6% for retail, 4% for manufacturing, and so forth. We have just gone through, we went through a, a round of permitting, and we, we, we permitted three retail dispensaries and two businesses that, that are sort of vertically integrated that include manufacturing, distribution, and, and delivery. And then we've just re we're going through another round of that, and we received three applications, um, and they're all for retail by delivery only. So they're gonna have a physical place of business in the commercial area, um, where we're doing exclusively delivery of the product. Yeah. Question. Is there a cap on the number of delivery permits that we're issuing? No, the only cap we have is on the retail storefront dispensaries of three. So, Madam Mayor, Councilmember Snedden, under the state law, we can't stop lawful deliveries from licensed state delivery people. So as many as come in, if they meet requirements, then they... Yeah, are. your council action in the ordinance put a numerical cap on the storefronts, but then just said allowable zoning for the non storefronts okay. So there'll be a natural limit to how many we can have. And I think what Aria was referring to is uh, the Bureau of Cannabis Control said that we cannot preclude lawful delivery businesses from coming in from other jurisdictions delivering into the city of Santa Barbara. 
tax revenue from that if they're delivered in the city of Santa Barbara? If we catch them. Good, good question. Yeah, so just been having conversations with, with the consultants and some people from the state. Um, they're technically subject to a tax if they're coming in. It's like a business license tax if you reside somewhere else. The problem is that there's a double taxation because they're, let's say they're coming to Goleta and they're delivering it to Santa Barbara. They're going to be taxed on their gross receipts for, for Goleta. And for us to impose a tax on, on them would be sort of double taxation. And it'd be difficult to do that. Um, but those that are physically located in the city, you yeah, know. yes, yeah. But if they're coming in, so what they're suggesting, they're looking, they're trying to develop some potential legislation to address this issue, where they might be requiring apportionment, so that if Lolita has a lot of delivery companies coming into Santa Barbara, that they can allocate a portion of those cannabis taxes to the city of Santa Barbara because it's <coughs> here for some arrangement. But currently, we won't be taxing anybody coming into here as long as they're lawful businesses in other jurisdictions. If they're illegal, then we can tax them and we run a lot of business. What's our, our, for those that are within the city, what's the tax rate and then what's good? Yeah, so 6% for retail dispensaries and delivery is 4% for manufacturing and testing. What Matt would know what testing is, I think it's also 4%. 4%. So the, del the delivery is 6 for us. Yeah. What, do you know what the lead is? It? I don't. Do we do? Do we do? I don't. That gets to the issue is of why when we when we set the rates we did, we wanted to be competitive with Galita because you didn't want to have it where right. we were so high, Galita does it now, everyone was a Galita and we still, right. yeah. And we looked at the county as well, so we kind of matched the county. So we're kind of in par with yeah. um, Galita yep. and the county. Yeah, I just know that Galita is probably going to have a lot more delivery businesses than we do. <laughs> Just real quick on that, Galita said we're going to have 15 storefront dispensaries, come one, come all, and then they got flooded with applications and they realized they were all clustered together and now they're kind of backpedaling and saying, well, we need to maybe have some distance requirements and stuff, so they're reevaluating. So we did include the, an estimate in our projections and we're going to put it in the next year's budget, the next year's budget for canvas taxes. But I will tell you that it's very difficult to project because we have no idea what that is. We don't have any numbers or data to go on. What we did was we took what they projected. So the initial round of applicants, they kind of gave their own forecast and model of how much money they're going to generate and what the tax might be. We cut that by more than half to get to our number. If just half would have been a million. We're going to be at the $800,000 range. Um, but it makes me nervous. You know, we'll see how it comes in, but at this point, we're going to assume $800,000, we're going to have to monitor it. Um, we'll see how it goes. Expenditures, um, this is by department, and, and I, I always point out public safety, not to pick on it, but because that's the nature of what a general fund does. I mean, if you think of its primary core, and if it doesn't else, public safety is probably the number one thing you would be doing. And, and, and this is very typical for a city in California where more than half or about half of their their budget is dedicated to public safety, meaning police and fire. If you're a contract city, you're not going to, it's probably not going to be the same. Um, but it's a big part of our budget. And if you look at our budget in general fund by what we call major object category, so things like salaries and benefits and the like, not by department. Salaries and benefits make up the lion's share. To the right is salaries alone, that's $68 million, 51%. Retirement to the left is about 18% and 21 million. And then other benefits like health insurance and the like is 13.4 million or 10%. Allocated costs, I mentioned those, those are the charges from information technology, from facilities, from fleet, from self-insurance fund, those are the allocated costs from internal service funds. And the supplies and services are kind of only 7%. So again, very typical that 79% of our budget is Salaries and benefits, that's just the nature of what a general fund does. It's very labor intensive, not a lot of capital involved. And as I mentioned, 9% for allocated cost, um, and then 12% for everything else. So when we talk about kind of our ability to address sort of shortfalls or deal with recessions, it's difficult. I mean, 80% of the budget almost is just labor. And so it's hard to kind of, when you have a major reduction of revenue, it's hard to sort of move that needle to rebalance unless you're dealing with salaries or services. And then general fund capital, we historically have taken a piece of the general fund revenues and dedicated that to capital in the million to $2 million range. 
a number of years ago when we had, when we had lots of surplus reserves, we used to just fund reserve capital out of reserves. And we were very conservative in our estimates, so we always ended up with these big year-end surpluses. Our budgets are a lot tighter, a lot more sort of refined, if you will. So we're, we, have to, we have to now fund our capital program um, from revenues. Doesn't include, so the general fund capital is one small piece, that doesn't include another $55 million this year in capital from other funds. Um, in the governmental funds, if you will, measure A, that's the Hafsen sales tax that I mentioned, mentioned. So there's gas tax revenues that come into the, to the city. 50% of the UUT, I mentioned about seven million, and then the Creeks fund, they have a lot of capital. So none of that is part of the general fund. And then enterprise funds, they have tremendous capital programs. So citywide, we think it's in the $100 million range this, this year we have in capital from all funds. Measure C, of course, is a new one. It's um, a general tax, not, not restricted. And it is dedicated to infrastructure capital that's not associated with an with enterprise fund, so it can be used for any governmental purpose. It's expected to generate about $22.6 million this year. Um, major win for us. Uh, that was a great campaign and a great win for the community ourselves. Amazingly, our needs are still greater than that $22 million, and you'll see that eventually when we continue that report. Um, but it's certainly it's a great amount of money that we have in extra or in addition to cover those needs. <laughs> reserves, so real quick, we have two, two reserve requirements within the general fund. Enterprise funds have a third for capital because of the nature of what they do, but for the general fund, there's two reserves. One is the disaster reserve, that's at 15% of the operating budget, as the name implies, for natural disasters and those kind of things. And then a contingency reserve, for anything that occurs that's unexpected. It could be a recession, it could be an unexpected budget hit, it could be anything. But in total, they make up 25% of our budget in terms of our reserve. And the thinking back in the 90s when this was first created was that we would have three months of operating costs covered from reserves. So if we had a, a complete loss of revenues because of a tsunami or a major earthquake that closed down the freeways and all that, we could, we could survive for three months covering all of our normal costs. Because our costs will be the same. In fact, our costs will be extraordinary uh, before insurance gets back to us and before we get any money back from FEMA and Cal OES. So $33 million is the policy. At the end of last year, we fell below policy, um, but only because of some shortfalls and some of the revenues we got. I mentioned that the state underpaid us last year for sales taxes, both in Measure C and a regular 1%, because they had a backlog of they had a system glitch backlog of processing these, these, these returns. We got all the money this year. So when I kind of make those adjustments for timing, in reality, we ended last year pretty close to being at policy. <coughs> this is a historical chart of what our reserve picture has looked like. You can see there was a period of time that we, our reserves were really well below policy. I think at one point we were about $10 million short. But since then, even during the connection with the Great Recession, we're able to restore reserves to where they're fully funded. Again, they fell short this past year, but that's just because of some timing of revenues. <coughs> so I expect them by the end of this year to be fully funded, primarily because not revenue is doing great, but because we're still seeing a lot of vacancies, particularly in police. Um, and library has a lot of vacancies, community development, and other departments. So our, our vacancy rate is higher than normal. Um, and then as I mentioned, that extra sales taxes that we got this year, that we owned last year, this, we're going to end the year, I think, pretty much at policy. Not much more of any. I wanted to point out to you a couple things that have committed our reserves. So most of our reserves, or generally our reserves, are, are represented by cash we have to be able to spend money as needed. We have committed some of those reserves. One of those is, a, is Beginning of this fiscal year in July, we um, lent the airport $3 million to, to kind of help them complete the whole um, building of, I think there are five buildings in the commercial industrial area. They're, they're light industrial buildings. They're all new. They had enough money to do three. The extra money from us is going to help them finish it off for the, for the five. Um, but that's a 10 year loan, so it commits that money to the airport, so it's not cash we have, but it is. They're paying us three and a half percent interest. Our current market rate is about two, two and a half percent we're getting in our investments. So it's a, it's a reasonable rate of return. It just commits us for 10 years. The one thing I will tell you is that the airport has the reserves. They could have done it themselves, but it would have meant going into their policy reserves. Um, and their policy reserves are in the four or five million dollar range compared to our 30 million. So we felt from a cash perspective, probably better not to decimate the reserves 
we had enough reserve to kind of cover it. Um, and if we had to really cast it in in a true emergency, we could look at the airport, the airport reserves to, to, um, to get that back. And then the Korea Arts Pavilion, we're going to be going to you on the 26th next Tuesday. And this is to execute what we talked about last year and approve the council. And that is to have the general fund reserves advance money to the, for the Korea Arts Pavilion project down the road because they're short about $9 million total. And we said we can take reserves from the general fund and then have it repaid from the Measure C because it's a qualifying project for Measure C purposes. So over the next five years, we would budget a million dollars out of the Measure C fund and coming back to the general fund to repay that $5 million advance. There's no interest to that, and it is truly unavailable money. It's not like a loan where we can call it back. It's money that's going to be spent. But we think it's a wise move rather than to decimate the Measure C funds in one year by $5 million for that project. Mr. Samaro, would you explain that the Cabrillo Arts Pavilion is a money maker for the city? Sure. Um, people have, movie stars have weddings there and stuff, and so it's really a... <laughs> you got married there? Nice. <laughs> Mary Castle. Uh, Jill Zachary. So the Cabrillo Pavilion, it's been in the city's inventory for 92 years now. It's a fantastic location for community events, as many of us know, as well as uh, the place where we have the hub for all of our recreation programs in the summertime. With the renovation, um, it's a significant undertaking because the building had gone uncared um, for for so long. We will be able to restart it as a wonderful community facility, both on the upstairs it's going to meet full ADA compliance, both interior and exterior, to today's standards, which is pretty impressive. And then the downstairs has been completely redesigned so that we can operate it year-round for recreation programs and services. So we do get revenue from the upstairs, primarily from community use, private community use, downstairs through recreation programs and fees, and then we have a restaurant concession that also provides revenue. Very good, thank you. So I mentioned that we had about a $9 million shortfall in funding for the Real Arts Project. $9 million came from the old bond proceeds from the redevelopment agency. We had some money that we committed toward that project. Um, but we're still short about nine. I mentioned $5 million is going to come out of general fund reserves. We were hoping that to the fundraising to come up with an additional $4 million. That's not looking good. So um, Paul and I and Jill and others are trying to figure out how do we come up with that extra $4 million this year, because we're getting close to finishing the project, given that we already committed $3 million for the airport and general fund reserves, $5 million is ready for that project, we're to be for the farm, so we're kind of looking at options for that. There's, there's still that funding gap that we're trying to figure out. Before we get into the fund conversation, any questions on any of that? Mr. O'Grath? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Smarter, so as you look at these reserves, and we, you've got them um, combined with, with general fund and enterprise fund in a total city fund reserve. Is there a reason why we don't break out the enterprise fund since they, they can't really in or out from the uh, general fund? We actually don't combine them. We're, we're, I, I didn't realize that, but we express our reserves in terms of the total budget, though, right? We, no, we, no. General fund. Yeah, this is just the general fund reserve, $30 million or $33 million, whatever that is. The enterprise fund has enterprise yes, funds each have separate reserves reserve and all reserve requirements. Okay, so that we do things like they loan money to an enterprise fund, then that's kept out separately. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're yeah, they're definitely separate legally and otherwise. Um, certainly, the general fund has the most reserves of any fund because it's the biggest. The water fund is pretty close, um, and they have the same reserve policy requirements. So they have to have a 15% disaster reserve, a 10% contingency reserve, and then a capital reserve that's equal to the average of the previous five years capital program funding. So they have, like water from probably $4 million in reserves just for, for the capital reserve in addition to their 10% and 15%. So any makeup and, and uh, reserve fund deficits we have to do through a fee resolution? Well, it's like we have a deficit here in our fund? Or no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think basically the only fund that I think has a potential, has a problem in terms of meeting its reserve requirements is the Gulf Fund because of what we talked about. But that's not a true enterprise. It's an enterprise fund, but it's not a utility. It's not restricted. Uh, but it has reserve team policy requirements, so it is, it's, 
is supposed to have 25% plus capital. Um, it's just not there yet. All the other enterprise funds are fully funded um, to varying degrees. Uh, beginning with our other policy, even airport, you know, they were having some challenges, but they're fully funded. Um, yeah. Okay. So we Bennett, make a distinction in terms another, of yeah, okay. we don't make a distinction between which enterprise funds is subject to our reserve policies now <coughs> than the restriction of those funds that they all have to have a reserve. Sorry, go ahead. Can you go back to the slides where it just was? Um, yeah, so for disasters, that's for an acute disaster. Yeah. And then what about slow moving disasters like sea level rise or are we are we just I know we're at the beginning of that planning, but budgeting wise, will that be coming out of individual enterprises or out of the larger is it following a disaster funding? Yeah, I would say that this is for acute disasters, how we come up with funding for the non acute sort of slow moving. Mm -hmm. That's probably a separate reserve we'd be talking about. It's yes. a policy question we're gonna have to have. At so we don't some point exactly and we it, haven't had it yet. Correct. Okay. You've got the sea level rise subcommittee that's kind of looking at all that and I can imagine some initial thoughts might come out of that for council to have a policy discussion. And I think it's going to come out of a whole bunch of different funds. You know, the, the waterfront is going to have sea level rise impacts. Um, but talking to their staff yesterday, but the Army Corps of Engineers might be the place you go to because keeping your harbor open and stuff has often been an Army Corps issue. But then you have your water and wastewater utilities that are down that could be impacted. So you might need to look at those. And then the general fund and kind of community way. It's a big issue. Yeah. Will it be next budget cycle that we start looking at that, or is this a it's, time when we might start? It's whenever council wants to start doing it. The challenge you're going to have is sea level rise is a 50 to 75 to 90 year impact. Do you want to start putting money away that can't meet, meet any other services or capital needs that you have, kind of preparing for something down the road? And that's just a tough issue all of coastal California mm -hmm. communities are going to have is when do you start putting money away for something that's still decades away from starting to have dramatic impacts on Tough policy call. So it's up to up to council's interest. And I, again, I think having the subcommittee kind of look at that and have some initial thoughts and kind of have it come out um, is a good start to that. That's a good suggestion. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to start with some basics because just make sure we sort of ground it on some of the things that just how how a pension plan in general is funded. The whole objective of, of the, the, the city's retirement program administered by PERS, California PERS, Public Employment Retirement System, is to accumulate the money for that benefit while the employee is working. And it, and philosophically, it makes sense because you're kind of matching the cost of, of that person in the, while they're providing the services to the community, so you want to measure that cost and all that. So we, it's not that you wait for them to retire and figure out how you're going to pay for the benefits. You accumulate, in theory, it's just like a college fund. You know, find your child for day three, you want to have money in place. So we're required to make contributions every year during the while the employee is working for the city. And we rely heavily, or PERS relies heavily, on investment returns to generate the money we need. So if you're building a fund, you're going to want to invest that. If it just so happens because of the way PERS invests its money, that about 70% of the monies that are eventually accumulated are not from employer or employee contributions. They come from investment returns. That's 7.5%, that's now 7 That's the power of compounding. And how they calculated, so different formulas for classic employees, those who were hired um, prior to 2013 or transferred from another agency, their formulas for non-safety are 2.7% at age 55. <coughs> Um, and then for safety, 3% age, and that should be age 50, yeah, sorry. And then for PEPRA employees, those that were hired after 2013, which is the new law in place, to reduce the benefits, they get 2% at 62, or 2% at age 60 is their safety. So a strict calculation, and this is just a make-believe sort of number, but if you have a 25-year employee, a classic employee, and their salary happens to be when they retire, $80,000, then they're subject to 2.7% formula, which means that you multiply that by 25 years of service times their, their final year salary or highest salary. So that means that they would get $54,000 per year for their entire life. For a pepper employee, that same calculation is 2% instead of 2.7, and um, they would get $40,000 instead. 
So when, when you think about what PERS has to do in trying to come up with the right amount of money for when people retire, they have to make a number of assumptions. And one is, what will somebody who's hired today be making when they retire 25, 30 years from now? A big assumption. They make assumptions about salary growth each year, but it's, it's just a wag. How many years will they work? So if you retire today, will they retire in 60, 55, 65, and all that? Then how long will they live? That's all mortality table-based, but that's a big factor. And then the biggest thing that they have to consider is, with all the monies that are contributed by employees and employers, how much money will they get when they invest that money? How much return will they get? They refer to that as a discount rate or the rate of return. So that's a big thing that they have to consider. And we'll talk more about that. So I'm going to walk through something just, I know it's going to be a little esoteric, but I, hope, but I think it might be helpful, or hopefully it will be helpful. So I'm, let's say that somebody had a projected benefit of $50,000. That is the calculated number that they would be paid when they retire for the rest of their life. And let's say they had this employee, Jane, who had 28 years of service, and a lifespan that was projected to 30 years. If you just do the math, you take $50,000 by 30 years that she's expected to live, that's one and a half million dollars that will be theoretically paid through the lifetime when they retire. How much money PERS needs when that person retires is not the full value of that because they're going to continue to invest that money and earn money. So, roughly speaking, they probably need somewhere around $700,000 by the time the employee retires. They pay off some of it every year, they continue to invest, so they eventually come up with one and a half million dollars. So this is kind of the idea here, is that the red line are the employer and employee contributions, the yellow line are what I talked about, the investment returns, and then that gets you the $700,000 that are going to be paid for the remainder of the life. There's 28 years here at the bottom, that's the how long the employee's employee. So during the time that they're employed, we're making contributions and building up these, these assets. So you've heard the term unfunded liability, and so what creates those? The biggest variable which creates those unfunded liabilities are investment returns um, on, on, in general, on an ongoing basis, because they're never right. You know, they can assume 7.5% or less, but they're never right, and you'll see why that is. And they make some assumptions about wage increases, and, but they're not, you know, it's just a wag, but they're generally okay because they're assuming 3% per year. That's kind of on average over a 20 or 30 year period what people get in terms of CPI increases. Um, and then another thing that could vary is how, people are, how long people are living. We've seen people are living longer and longer, so every 10 years you've got to adjust the mortality tables, and that becomes an unfunded liability. And then benefit enhancements, just back in 2000 when um, particularly safety plans went from 2% of 50 to 3% of 50, it, it applied retroactively to all years of service, and that was a major impact and that created a lot of unfunded liability early on. The Great Recession was the next big thing that hit us. But this is no longer allowed under PEPRA. We can't do benefit enhancements that are retroactive. Uh, but that definitely had an impact on a lot of agencies back in the 2000s. This is what I alluded to. This is the rate of return that, it, that PERS has realized over the last 23 years. I think it's like in 25 years. But it's all over the place. That yellow line that's kind of dotted, that's what their assumption is. That's at least it was 7.5%. But you can see they've never hit it. They've never hit it. And they've been as low as 24%. That was the Great Recession. So about a quarter of their assets, somewhere around 80 or $90 billion just disappeared. And even though they had a substantial increase two years later, 21%, it still doesn't make up for that 24% loss. As I said, Matt, when you do the math, in order to break even, you need like a 40 or 50% return in one year to undo that 24% drop. But it's all over the place. And this is really what's caused the problem for curves, particularly for local agencies, because on a 20 or 30 year basis, they're probably going to earn the 7.5% they assume, but it's the volatility that creates the problem for budgets, for local agencies and county budgets. So they just, it's up and down. And that's really created heartache for a lot of folks, <coughs> particularly because it's driven by these rate returns that are all over the place. So this is our unfunded liability because of all these things that have occurred benefit enhancements, um, rate of return of the low expectations, the Great Recession. That, the, that decimated their assets. Our current unfunded liability is $330 million. As of 2016, that's the last valuation date that the person has completed. You can see how it breaks down between the three plans we have, between miscellaneous, fire, and police. Police, 42% um, is the biggest slice. They're not, you know, they're a big group. They're, they're not as big as miscellaneous, and they're bigger certainly than fire. 
Looks like a big number, but think in terms of 20, 30 years, mm -hmm. this is not going to take like a mortgage. It's not going to come. You thought about some, money, some people's mortgages, and you're, that's a lot of money. You know you have 30 years to pay that. But this is our funded status. So this is kind of looking at what are we supposed to have in terms of total money and what do we actually have. So the, the blue line or bar represents what, how much in assets we're supposed to have based on what our current accrued liability is, and the orange line is what we have. What's interesting is that for a few years, our funded liability, our funded status was going up, but lately it's gone down. And we're in the 70% positions. It's not great, not bad, but not great. I'd like to see it in the 80, 90% range. 100% would be great, but that's not necessarily, that's not necessary. Um, it just depends on where you're at and kind of the economic cycle. But here are the dollars. This tells you sort of in what we're supposed to need in terms of total assets. Some of the things that PERS has done that's kind of helped make this thing, this problem worse, is in 2014, they, you know, after a few years of kind of messing around with it, they decided we've got to do something that's going to address the 24% drop in assets in 2008 or 2009. So they implemented a five year um, phase in of rate increases starting in 2016 through 2020. A year later, they announced that, oh, by the way, we have to revise our mortality tables, and we wish they do over 10 years, because people are living longer. So we're going to phase that in over a five-year period, starting at 17 through 21. So we've already seen this have a big impact in our rates in the next 10 years or so. But then it kind of lowered the boom on us with this change, where they both decided they're going to lower the discount rate, remember the assume rate of return, remember how important that is on a compounding basis, even though it's going down only half a percent, it's a big impact. So they're going to phase it in in three steps. This year, it was the first step, where they lowered it from 7.5 to 7.375. Next year, to 7.25, and then they're going to go all the way in year three to 7%. And each of those increments will be phased in over five years. So in total, it's going to be an eight-year phase in starting this year. So by 2025, it'll all be phased in every single step. And that's why we've been talking about the next eight years that we're going to see this impact. We're going to, we're going to see a continued growth in the rates as we phase in these three steps through 2025. And then hopefully it'll start to level up a little bit, but we're not sure. So this is what the employer rate. So this is just what the employer, the employer pays, not what the employee pays, which, is, which for, for public safety is 9%, for miscellaneous it's around 10%. So 2018 rates, you can see on the left, and by 2025, and all this is phased in, and these are just based on PERS projections, you know, they're, I'm not sure how much they're worth, but, and this assumes that they continue on every year to achieve 7.5% rate of return. So we're going to have a major recession, or a major boon, that, that could have an impact. But both fire and police are going to be starting here, but they're going to both get 85% of, as a rate, which means that for every dollar of salary, 85 cents will have to be paid to PERS to continue to fund their existing bank. And then for, for miscellaneous, it's 27% last year, it'll go to 41. You see that line is a little more flat, and that's because of the, the cost sharing formula that was uh, agreed to back in 2006. The miscellaneous enhanced their benefits of 2%, 2.7%. They agreed to pay for that and pick up a third of any increase in rates. So, as that line goes up, so will the employees' contribution will go up. About four years ago or five years ago, it was in the 6% range. Today, miscellaneous employees are contributing about 10.2%, and that's going to continue to go up as it's going up. What are other agencies doing? On the cost control side, they're doing exactly what he's talked about with miscellaneous, but across the board, cost sharing formulas. What's good about the solution is when you think about the, the impact of the rate increases, we're going to see this, the pension costs kind of go up steadily for the next eight years. Cost sharing is kind of matches that versus making a, a cut, making some cuts, which is then the recovery for that year. The next increase in the first cost, you have to make new cuts, whereas cost sharing helps solve that sort of thing, runs tandem with that problem. Some agencies are doing one-time compensations like bonuses that aren't personable, so as a way of recognizing that maybe it's difficult to give it, you know, raise salaries, but giving other types of compensation that aren't personable so they don't exaggerate the problem. 
And then more compensation shifted to um, to benefits again because benefits aren't personal. So more toward the increase in the cap for, for health insurance. And then minimizing salary increases. We're not in this situation, unfortunately, where where some cities have extra revenues every year or one time money. But those agencies like Newport Beach who are generating millions of dollars of surplus every year, what they're doing is they're building up a reserve. And the idea with this reserve is in the next five years, as these rates start to go up and costs go up, to build up reserves, invest them, and, and so that when you hit start approaching that peak of cost, you can kind of level that off a little bit by using some of these reserves to cost and the cost. So it's sort of creating this flattened permit versus a peak that's going to hit 2024-25. So if you had extra money, you would do that internally. You build up your own reserves, kind of like a separate reserve in our own general fund. Or some agencies are doing what's called a Section 115 trust work. And the idea is you can put this in the trust and invest it more aggressively, ironically, invest it more aggressively than we can because you can start investing in equities just like PERS does, like stocks. You can do that through a Section 115 trust. Personally, I think it's a little risky, but some agencies are doing that. We have extra money. Another thing we can do if we have extra money is to buy down our debt. You know, when you think about this three hundred and seven million dollar unfunded liability, it's like a mortgage for the next 20, 30 years. If you can make extra payments, you're just sort of having to buy down that debt and reduce your overall cost. This can have minuscule impact unless you have thirty million dollars available to sort of send it through. Some people are shortening their amortization periods go differently than a thirty year mortgage or a fifteen year mortgage. Economically, is it makes a lot of sense. The amount of interest you pay is, is savings going to be tremendous. And the budgetary impact is going to have a little bit of impact on your payment. It's going to raise your payment, which is difficult for agencies to pay more, even though economically, over a 30 year period, you know you're going to save money, which is budgetarily it's a tough one to do. Just to follow on that, because um, Councilwoman Sned and kind of raised the issue on sea level rise of setting across reserves. You, you can see from a policy perspective, you've got competing priorities working on concepts like that. We've adopted kind of a capital investment by taking half of our year in reserves and putting it into general fund capital and the rest going to your general fund reserve policies. So that's one approach. You can start setting money aside for a sea level uh, rise uh, if you want to toggle back one of those other two where this is another approach that a lot of cities are doing to deal with their retirement costs. So that's where the policy guidance comes in, where you want to set your priorities on. What is Newport Beach doing to have extra money? <laughs> They're a very rich community. We're yeah. rich too, ish. Yeah, you know, it's funny because you think about Newport Beach and even Santa Monica, so Newport Beach, we get about $33 million in property tax revenues. We're, we're not quite as big, but close. They get somewhere like 80, 90 million dollars in property tax revenues. Because mm -hmm. all their properties are all very commercial. Yeah, they've got a lot more commercial They've got mm -hmm. high rises, commercial centers, much different scale from a development standpoint. <laughs> yeah, and in Santa Monica, they get 30 million from business license taxes. We get 2 million dollars in business license taxes. Okay. So when you say there's 330 million unfunded liability, that means if everybody retired tomorrow, we wouldn't be able to pay. Is it? You know, sort of. I, I see it as sort of, kind of think of it as a funding sort of plan, in, maybe in simple terms. You want, you need $100,000 for a college fund, and you know that by year 10, the age 10, you should have $60,000, but you only have 40,000, and you're short. But you're not going to go to college yet. So we're, you know, just along this funding horizon, we, we don't have the money we're supposed to have to be sure that when they retire, the money is there. That's the shortage. And there are times when people we don't have the money there, and we have to continue part of our own liability. But nobody's going to retire at once, and it's based on what they're expecting to get. That we retire not today. And how, PEPRA must be helping, right? We're already seeing. It will. Can it, you explain? The PEPRA will eventually help once we kind of get to take a big chunk out of the unfunded liability. So PEPRA doesn't change the people with $330 million of the mortgage. The fact that we have new employees with different benefits doesn't change the fact that you still have this debt to regardless of your of makeup of your, of your employees. Over time, when we get past 2025, when some of this debt is hopefully paid down through these, these new policies changes, then we're going to start seeing then the benefits of PEPRA employees more pronounced um, you know, late 2020. But not in the next year. Any other questions? Okay. 
So this is sort of the kind of the so the end of the chapter in the book. This is a multi-year forecast. Kind of what does this all mean in the, in the next few years? And we do this. We maintain this throughout the year. We kind of make a normal, formal as part of this budget process. When we do a multi-year forecast. And we typically look out three, four years. You know, the further you go out in the general fund, it's much more difficult. Whereas if you think of a water fund, we do sometimes 10, enterprise fund, we do 10 year forecasts because things are more predictable and stable and we can control sort of our revenue base. Beyond three or four years, it's difficult because of volatility. But it's still important for us um, because we got to say, have a sense of what's the next two years going to look like so we can get directions of the department. So we in cut mode, or in surplus mode, or static mode. And then for us, what's really important is to identify any structural imbalance. That's where you look at one year, it can look really good, but if you look at three years, you can start seeing some trends that are negative, or either lines are separating between revenues and expenses, or not. You know, so it's really important for us to kind of get a sense of what the, the future looks like. Because if we know your problem three years from now, we should be doing something about it today to make sure that doesn't come to fruition. So, you know, I, in the past I've done tables, a lot of numbers, I thought I'd really simplify this. <coughs> the, the blue line are our total revenues and the red line are our total expenditures. And I started with 19 because 19 is the adopted budget, we had a balanced budget. And then what it's looking like for 2021 and 22, we're going to submit a balanced budget in 20. So to the extent you see any gap there, we're going we're to resolve that. But the point of this is with an assumed 1% salary increase going forward, through 2022, we have a slight structural imbalance. We see by 2022 about a $9 gap. Not a big number, um, generally speaking, um, but certainly it, you can see that the lines, we're certainly not generating surpluses and we're kind of going apart. Going apart. If we were to do a 2% just one year, next year, do a 2% salary increase instead of one, but then 1% for the remaining years, <coughs> just sort of one time bump in salaries. That grows, that gap grows to a million and eight by 2022. And if we were to say, let's, let's give 2% salary increases every year for the next several years, then that gap grows to $2.4 million. So that's kind of where we're at. You know, we, we can just about afford 1% salary increase unless we do cuts to services or new revenues come in. So that's kind of how the how this looks for the next Bob, few years. on that uh, 2.4, for all of those, that's assuming that the economy kind of is where it is, yep. right? So yep. we have, so the... And I'll, I'll kind of go through a recap of what all this means, yeah. but that's exactly what I'm going for sure. <clears throat> and this is something new, I, I don't know how helpful this is going to be, but one of the things I wanted to be able to show is, what is the, in terms of dollars, what's the growth every year in our revenues? So this blue line, blue chart bar is, from 19 relative to 18, revenues are going to grow about 2.1. In 2020, big number because remember to catch up with sales tax dollars. This, I'm sorry, this is the new revenues we talked about, cannabis and property taxes, that's what we see there. And then it levels off. But the red bar is the increase in just retirement, not selling to finish, but just retirement costs, pension costs every year. And what this says to me is that of all of our revenue growth in the next several years, on average, when we normalize some of these timing things, because the pension cost increases are going to consume about half of our revenue growth. Does that make sense? So Say it again. So if we, on average, grow 3% per year on revenues, about 1.5% of that growth is going just to keep up with, with our pension costs. So, so pension is a big part and is what you need from our revenue to just to keep up with it. So if you speak to the recession, we have the recession, so we're seeing revenues go down, then we're, you know, the pension costs are going to go down. And we're going to be sort of dealing with really bigger deficits. It's just it's, this, it's a it's a silent killer from a budget standpoint that your employees don't feel, uh, but it's just a cost that comes off right off the top, automatic that leaves you know less of the revenue growth available for salaries, service enhancements, or whatever else. Yeah. Okay. On that previous slide, you said with the gap, so is that the 2.4 million in 2022? Is that added to whatever the gap was to 2021, or is that at no, that's point total. the cumulative that's a, that's gap? A total, yes. So over those yes. years, so by 2022, the, the gap would be 2.4. In the meantime, all this, what that means is if we don't do anything else, we let that occur, it's just being ready to be reserves. 
uh, a fair amount of money per year. So that's the total. Half of 2022, that would be the year. total amount that would need to. That's the difference between all. revenues and expenditures in 2022. Between the total uh, cost and the total revenue. I'm not sure. For just but, that year. So yeah, just in 2021, year. there's a gap. So yeah. you're adding those yes. each. Yes. So the, the 2.4 is not the cumulative total, it's just no. a snapshot. Just that, that one year, yes. Okay. So. No, thank you. So the takeaways, there is a structural imbalance. That's what we kind of look for, why we do multiple forecasts. And a 1% salary sort of assumption is not tremendous. I think it's reasonably manageable. Um, one thing that does worry me, I mentioned this, you know, we do have $1.8 million in new revenues starting next year, which is great. A million of that is the property taxes that we're very fortunate because it kind of bought us some time to sort of push this problem back. If it had not been for those new revenues, we would be dealing with true deficits next year, next year's next plan. And I mentioned this too, the county have a yard line on $800,000 of cannabis tax revenues. And statewide, they're, they're telling the local agencies and, and any entity that's got cannabis taxes to be very conservative because they're not coming in with, like what they thought. But there, there's, the tax rates are still, still too high when you combine local and, and state tax rates or whatever. But they're, so we're, we've still got 800000 To me, that's a, that's a risky proposition. Um, forgive my ignorance on this, but assuming everything stays the same, if we have to deal with this structural imbalance, it will come through service reduction, or? Probably, I mean, depending on the magnitude, but it's certainly be looking at reducing staffing levels, which almost always means reduction in service time. So the 1%, even at a 1% sign increase, you see there was a slight sort of separation you know, we may see cannabis tax revenues coming in a lot better than we think. Uh, we may never have a recession in the next three, four years. I just have a hard time believing that by 2022, even with a salary increase of 1% per year, that we won't have to make some of the cuts. It's hard to imagine, but I, I can't be, hopefully I'm wrong. And again, that doesn't even factor, you know, the economic downturn is not built in any of the solution. But the bigger question is, if, you know, assuming we can only afford 1%, is that really sustainable in terms of our labor and being competitive and all that? That's a bigger conversation, but that's, a, that's certainly a big issue. You did? So that summarizes the financial stuff. We can take questions now. You right. can take a stretch break. I we will take a break, but I did want to ask. So some of us were hoping that we could budget for a 2% salary increase, what would have to happen to be able to make that happen? So good cannabis um, revenues is one thing. Um, yeah, it would have to be more, you know, I'm not sure what we can sort of do on the revenue side to push them up to balance the offset the impact of that. Um, I think it's going to have to be some level of attrition or reduction in, in cost somewhere. Um, those politics that you need to make. Yeah, it, either Assume a different revenue assumption if you think we're being too conservative and you assume more revenue in one of those key revenue sources, or it's a reduction in services that we provide. Those are the only two real toggles that we have. Okay. And then I have a question. Oh, something to that point, or do you have other questions? That's uh, a different question. Okay. Then if I, I'll go ahead and finish, Mr. Gutierrez. So you were talking about over the top TV earlier, and would that solution be legislative or? You said you had a team of finance managers. What if you need some attorneys to, would it be a matter of suing them for that revenue or? Yeah, it's, it's not legislation. It's because it's a local tax, local ordinance. Oh. Um, the city of Pasadena, they issued a, a, an administrative rule, a letter to all these entities saying, you're, you owe us a set of users tax. And it hit the papers and it became this Netflix tax, so we got a lot of bad press, so we, you know, so we kind of have to sort of step back. But it's going to require either a lawsuit or trying to work cooperatively with the industry to get them to be at least incrementally to start, you know, paying on some of the things that are easily identifiable as, as video services, some things are a little more nebulous. Um, but that's going to be a slow process, whether it's legislatively or just working cooperatively with them. The Did you have something to add? Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council, that the same process happened with uh, online travel booking agencies and cities ultimately were unsuccessful in trying to collect TOT on the spread between what the hotelier receives and what the 
booking agency charges. So the same thing happened here earlier with UUT and what Mr. Samario is saying is that there'll be another test case when the circumstances are right. Um, and then I did want to say um, that you were talking about airport fund earlier. I'm sorry, I'm going back all the way to the beginning of your. Yeah. And I met with our new airport director a couple of days ago, Henry Thompson, and he told me that. Um, <laughs> go ahead and stand up. I want to welcome you. Um, that the airport has so many new uh, flights that for the people who think we built a giant terminal and it's empty, no, it's full, and there's more interest maybe from South Southwest Airlines, and so uh, possibly, uh, and uh, uh, so just to let people know our airport is doing really well, I just wanted to throw that out there. But that was the extent of my questions. Mr. Gutierrez, you had your hand up? Yeah. Uh would it be possible or make sense at all to lower the cannabis tax and allow for more permits so to make up the difference? It's a policy question. Yeah, sure. With a vote of four or five of council. I think we decided it was a majority vote on how many cannabis permits. Yeah, the, 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 so, the, the, so, it's, so it's a vote of council. Yes. We adopted an ordinance, uh, and so it's a four vote majority. If you wanted to change the cannabis tax and increase the number of storefronts, that it's, it's a policy call. Sorry. Any other questions for Mr. Smart? Okay, so I mean, yeah. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to ask her. Um, kind of going back to the issue of um, salary, um, our staff, the one, two, one percent, two percent on slide fifty-eight. So I'm just trying to understand what the options would be if we have a 2.4 million by 2022. Um, and we did, and the, the projections come in basically pretty close to what you said for the revenue side. If we didn't lose positions, then what this, the, a slide 58, for those who don't have in front of them, says is that 79% of general fund is for salaries and benefits. And then another 9% is internal service funds, so we can't really count that. So then we would be left with the option of either, re so just so I understand where we're at, because I, I think we need to be competitive for our staff, the options to make up that, that gap would fall either on actual positions, or not filling vacancies, or that 12% that's left over. Correct. I'm just trying to see if we wanted to go 1% or even higher, what are our options? Um, aside from generating new revenue, which I mean, yeah. we were going to try to do, cannabis is one. I mean, that's the option to go for that. But yeah. without the positions, that, that's 80% of the budget is the positions themselves. So I just want to understand because that's 2.4. So, so I'll just give you my historical perspective, and each year is different and councils are different. But right, the general fund is mostly salaries and benefits. It's 80% as we've shown. You know, there's a small amount of general fund capital. You could reduce that if you wanted to save a little money in that regard. Um, and then the quandary you get when, you're, when you have to reduce services is generally the political entities have said that we don't want to touch public safety. So then you take away kind of 58% of the pie by saying public safety is safe and you know, over here. And so then you're left with the smaller amount of the remaining of the general fund to kind of make up those cost reductions. And that hits your libraries, parks and recreation, and community development departments. And so that's the quandary you get into when you start saying, Let, let's carve out some uh, savings through uh, positions to pay for salaries. Yeah. And then if you went without, if you drew a line that we don't want to cut positions, mm -hmm. then it further withers it down to that 12% that's left. Right? Yeah. 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 But, you know, that 12% is supplies and services, and those are just basic things you need. I mean, you know, the track solar services are the things you need, like paper and pencils and things like that. It's a very small portion of our budget. To cut that, you know, do some training. We've done that in the past. We've sort of cut training. But the amount of money you can generate out of that is pretty minimal in terms of cutting. Maybe you can pull out a couple hundred thousand dollars out of there. So then the only other option would be to find new revenue sources. Yes. Yes, go ahead. So, the, um, so police right now is understaffed. It is in this 
budget right now what the cost would be if it was fully staffed? Yes. Or okay, so and so that's what, reserved in there yeah, for yeah, that. So what okay. we do is we budget this fictitious revenue which represents what we expect to generate each year in salary savings from turnover, salary benefit savings. And it varies from year to year, but like this past year we had a high variance because of the number of vacancies in police, library. So our estimate is about $2.3 million if we budget the revenue. So we kind of plug in some provision for savings and just turn over staff. It's been higher than that, so we're going to look at that as one option this coming year in terms of should we be playing with that. We can see, can, we expect to see it higher than the normal sort of savings, but, but we do plug in something for that. So it's not, the budget isn't just based on a full complement of staff. It recognizes that there, that there are vacancies that we have in here. But for police in particular, yes, we budget for that full allotment that we'd like them yeah. to get to. Okay. And fill yeah. those vacancies. And for every department, for yeah. So it's not like use it or lose it. No. It's still, okay, that's already in the budget. Yeah. And then, the, the, I mean, just in terms of positions, I think, I mean, it's been mentioned before, I think, I know I definitely support um, a dedicated energy analyst or somebody for um, Alilia Prento to have as, uh, in that department. How, what would be the process for considering that, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that because I do think that that's one of the council priorities and that will come out of that energy master plan and some recommendations but it'll time up with the budget and we'll have to see how we fund it and how you add that cost under an already tight budget uh, do some of the enterprise funds contribute to some of that cost are there other kind of ways that we can look to fund it so that's, that's coming yep. Thank you. so at the end of Mr. Casey's um, presentation we'll have we'll have chats to ask him and give feedback and Mr. Dominguez well, just on that last comment I would ditto the idea of uh, giving her some assistance because that's money that repays the, the general fund or the enterprise funds if we go that direction the other thing in regards to the one percent or what we're going to do for our employees I'd love to have us look even more um, closely at what management groups we could possibly get some salary savings to give it to some of the more frontline troops who are working for the city because of the, the CPI, the housing costs of the city. I know the PD restructured and eliminated a high management position. I'd love to see if we can pick a few more positions to do what we can, um, assuming that there's that possibility. Okay, and if there's nothing else, we'll, we'll take a 10 minute break and I'd like to thank Julia Wynn from City TV for taping or recording, and it'll be on our website. So we're in recess for 10 minutes. So we'll call our meeting back to order. And Mr. Casey, whenever you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. I will keep mine fairly straightforward. I'll cover kind of the major workload list. Uh, we'll go over the budget calendar, and then we really want to open it up to any further questions and comments you might all have. For those in the audience, I believe we have handouts up on the table of this kind of major policy efforts. So I put this together with the help of the department heads. The department head team is here to answer any questions. Just to give you a sense of the variety and enormity of issues that we're working on as your city staff uh, at your direction. Kind of based as Mr. Long said earlier, you know, how I listen, we all listen kind of throughout the year, what we think kind of your top priorities are. Uh, this list is not all inclusive. There are things that we are working on that didn't make this list just to the sense of brevity. Certainly ask a question if you want to to make sure that uh, we're on it. But let me just kind of walk you through it real quick. And again, if you want to dig into some of the issues, just kind of check on status. We've got the resources here to do that. Um, so I kind of lumped down kind of some initial six citywide efforts, kind of what I feel from listening to you all over the last year, kind of some of your top policy goals you want us to continue to focus on. And a lot of these cross a lot of departments, so uh, even if some below are listed by department, there are others who are working on it as well. You all adopted in the last fiscal year a very bold policy of going to renewable energy by 2030. And we've been responding to that. You funded an en energy study you just got a draft on that. The Sustainability Committee has been looking at it uh, seriously as well. The energy study is going to get wrapped up in the next couple months or so and bring back some recommendations. And some of those recommendations could include the need to staff up, create a division of energy or something like that to implement some of those goals. So that's something we're looking at internally. 
not sure how we would fund it, and that's where I said we might have to look creatively and see if we can pencil something together. Uh, but at the staff level, we've heard you loud and clear that that's a priority in an arena you really want to get into and be a leader on. Um, and so we're going to try to find a way to help us continue to go there. So that includes the Energy Master Plan, continues to evaluate community choice, energy, and a lot of the other efforts. Um, drought is still on the list. Uh, we'll see how the next couple months go. We have had a wonderful couple months from a rain standpoint. Kachuma is up to around 60% and still flowing, which is wonderful. And so I think the real hard pressure of the drought has been pulled off a little bit, but I think we're, we're not quite ready to say we're out of the drought. Let's see how the rest of the winter goes uh, and continue our analysis and efforts. And so we'll bring back a drought policy effort, I think, late March, early April, once we kind of get to the rainy season and see where we really stand. As you know, that has been a six-year, very intense effort on the organization. So we're all kind of thrilled to at least have a little breather uh, and get some substantial water. In of it. You know, it's at 60%. Last time when Kachuma was getting down to 60%, that's when we started entering into our drought preparation. So um, not fully out of the picture yet. <laughs> Housing, housing, housing. Dave Davis, when he hired me, said, Paul, there are three things in Santa Barbara that will always be the same. You'll always fight about housing, water, and transportation. And it's just kind of true. And so housing continues, to, I think, to be at the forefront of your policy discussions and deliberations. That's the average unit density program. Inclusionary is teed up. It's going to planning commission in the next couple weeks, and then we'll be uh, coming to you all. We've got the phase two amendments on the AUD program, and we've got the state legislation and compliance that's really going to ramp up. Uh, we've seen legislation in the past number of years limiting local control, and you now have a governor, which is one of his top priorities, is to address the housing issue. And he's putting cities on notice that they're coming and they're coming hard, and he's directed his HCD and there's legislation that uh, Ariel has passed around that's giving HCD some real teeth for the first time in years. Um, HCD has been kind of a toothless agency. They require you to do housing elements, but there hasn't been a lot of consequences for not. And the state's really starting to ramp up uh, putting consequences on the local level. The frustrating part, I think, for us is they take a cookie cutter approach throughout the entire state. And that cookie cutter approach doesn't always work in Santa Barbara. And it also doesn't reflect the fact that Eric was mentioning the other day that we've done an outstanding job on the affordable housing front with the City Housing Authority and other partners having about 11% of our units in capitally affordable throw in Section 8 housing on top of that, and you're well over 15 or 16%, which is a very impressive number for a city. Um, and yet the state is still coming down with some pretty draconian stuff. So we'll continue to talk to you about that. Downtown revitalization, clearly another area of major priority for council and the community. We've talked a lot about that. We've had Nina and staff come and show you the 50 different items that we're doing. You've hired Cosmont and Associates to try to compile ideas from the community and else and come up with a strategic plan to kind of focus our efforts. So you'll consider to see, continue to see quite a bit on that. Measure C, we're still kind of in the early stages of building up our Measure C implementation. That's the one cent sales tax. Um, it's a wonderful spot to be in, uh, to have money to work with. But as uh, Bob said, it's still not quite enough. And the problem is, is that it's a lot of money over the next 20 or 30 years. And we all want to see everything done in the next two or three years. There's just not quite enough money to, to get everything done immediately. Uh, but it's a much better position to be in. But priorities continue to be the police station. That's moving along well and hopefully we'll be able to choose a site selection by summertime. Daily Guerra Plaza kind of being affiliated with that. That's actually really exciting. It's that of the new home for the farmer's market and revitalizing downtown, and then a real focus on streets and roads in that regard. And then homeless efforts. I put that down just as another kind of major multi-departmental effort that we're working on. Uh, it's an issue that we struggle as a society to deal with. We struggle as a community how to deal with and we're struggling with as a city organization about how to appropriately address and, and be effective at that. Very shortly in the next week or two, we will bring the HEAP grant to council uh, for approval, which is exciting. We're going to get two to three million dollars. I forget what the final number is. Two, two million dollars. That's going to help us with the city net outreach team. First time partnership with Cottage Hospital to get the nurse practitioner out in the field some additional restorative policing assistance and other efforts. And then I'm, I'm projecting that we'll come back to you in April or so with kind of a, a city net uh, 
presentation, but kind of also a comprehensive look at all that we're doing across all the different departments to try to address all those issues. And I think it's time for us just to kind of sit down and kind of look at that comprehensively and, uh, and talk about that. And we'll also invite our partners to come to that meeting as well. In including Home for Good? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Home for Good, you know, we'll invite PATH, the folks that we give, you know, specific money to. Uh, you also have your human service grants. And there's a lot of organizations. I'm not sure we'll bring over. Transition House. Yep, we yep. do quite a bit. So, okay. so we'll give you a good summary on, on all that. Okay. Yeah. So regarding the, the April conference, look, I'm really excited for that to come. And um, what do we have in terms of staffing that are how many FTEs or percentage of FTEs do we have that? dedicate themselves to this issue? That's a good question, and we can get that for that presentation. Again, it's fragments of staff across a variety of departments. The police department has probably the most dedicated number of staff with the restorative <coughs> and tactical patrol force and others who are focused a lot on issues. We've got a position in community development with Laura Devils that's kind of half time of her job while she does other responsibilities, and then other departments have responsibilities. So we'll, we'll look at that and get you that. And if it makes sense for that April meeting, I'd love to hear an option where we upgrade that because uh, the problem's just getting exponentially worse. And so I think we need to throw some more resources at it strategically and effectively. But I think uh, if we could upgrade that position, again, whatever options you think makes sense, but that's just one concrete idea. Okay. Yep. So I kind of look at those as kind of some of the, the largest, most pressing issues. If you don't mind, I'll just go by department, just to give you a sense of the scope and magnitude. I, I was speaking to the grand jury this morning, and I can't tell you the questions they asked me. And that's more um, but I always inter uh, introduce myself to them, and I tell them how much I love my job. Uh, it's so much fun to be city administrator for the city of Santa Barbara for a number of reasons. One, we're a full-service city. And as a policy junkie and city management professional, I love working for a full-service city. We have a commercial airport and a working harbor. We have our own water and wastewater utilities, which A, I think is fun to manage, and B, I think makes for better public policy making. You have one entity, you all, making those land use decisions that touch transportation and water and wastewater, and so you're comprehensively looking at it all. I just think that's a good government that's exciting to work for. Um, got great staff. And it's fun working for the city of Santa Barbara because we're kind of a larger city in a relatively smallish pond such that what we do makes a difference. Uh, it's really fun to see the fruits of our labors up close and personal. So uh, that's kind of the excitement as we go through the different departments of all the stuff we're going on. Administrative services, we're just going alphabetically, not because Christy's my favorite, um, but, but you are, you are Christy. We're running, we're running an election. Don't, don't worry, when I get to airport, Henry's my favorite. Um, we're running election this November, and we have two more odd year elections to run. Uh, and so remember, we're transitioning now to even year elections. So those of you who are up for election in the community, whoever is running this November, except for District 6, they're filling out the remaining two years of Greg's term. But Districts 1, 2, and 3, you're up for five year seats. Uh, coming this November, because that's what the, the citizens approved as part of the charter to transition us to even your elections. So we're running this election, and Sarah's running the bar. No, 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 that was good. Do you want to mention the uh, uh, redistricting? Yes, I will get there. Um, this election is a little bit harder for us because most cities in LA County have gone to even your elections. Not many people are still in odd year elections. And so the firm that we used to use has gone out of business to help us run the election. So we have to kind of figure out a way to run the election for these next two odd years by looking at different approaches. And so Sarah and Christy and Pam have been working on that diligently. We've got a couple of options to pull it off. One of them might be contracting with the county of Los Angeles to help us run the election. The county of Santa Barbara can't do it this year. They're going through a change in their technology and they have a March primary they're gearing up for. And so uh, we talked to Joe Holland. He said they just don't have the ability to pull it off. So we're looking at different options, but just giving you a heads up, one of them might be contracting with the County of LA. County of LA runs a ton of elections. They're a professional shop, they know what they're doing. So we're, we're hoping that they can do that. That would be kind of the simplest. It might mean election night might be delayed a little bit because we're having to shift the balance down. So just oh boy. a warning you now. Exactly. 
and other issues in, oh, oh, and then redistricting. Sorry, Arl. Why don't you talk a little bit about it? Okay, the, the uh, district uh, elections lawsuit settlement calls for appointment of an independent redistricting commission comprising three retired judges. Uh, the deadline is November 1, 2021 for the redistricting to be complete. So we'll need wow. to start working in 2020 uh, to be organized. And by be organized, I mean uh, securing, estimating the funding we'll need for that commission and its support. The support will include at a minimum a demographer. Uh, so we'll be, we'll need to come to you sometime in fiscal 20 to get that train rolling. Right, it'll be after the census. Yes, yeah. driven by the census. Quick question on that. You said it has to be complete by? 1-1-21, uh, excuse me, 11-1-21. But don't we have an election like three days after that? Yes. And so does the election three days after we like the current districts or I the was, districts? When I looked at the date, I asked myself the same question today. I don't know. I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, I I don't see how it can work if Three the new maps are supposed to be ready in uh, 11-1. So. Yeah. So I may have to call Mr. Capello and see what he thought. That would cost us $300,000. Not a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> um, then under, under administrative services, we have information technology, so they're implementing a lot of software improvements. The Acela implementation is going to go live. March 4th. March 4th. So we're finally getting that up and running. It's been a lot of work and uh, we'll be excited to get that behind us. We'll then be moving towards the constituent relation management application next fiscal year. We're doing a study of that this year, which we told you all we would do. And you've approved a new time and attendance software implementation, which will bring us into the 20th century, let alone the 21st century. Uh, we're not having to fill out yellow sheets. Labor agreement negotiations. Um, Give Christy and Sam a hug. Pretty much every labor union is up for renegotiation. It's a lot of work. Uh, and so it's a lot of work on you all as well. So I'll give you a hug. And then we're going to bring back a, a status report on the bilingual communications plan. Next, last fiscal year, you hired an additional resource in the fire department uh, for bilingual outreach that would also be available citywide. We're working internally with kind of a comprehensive approach and plan. And so we'll be coming back and presenting that to you all in the relatively near future. Airport, lots of stuff going on in the airport. Um, the light industrial development uh, buildings are going up, they're under construction. If you're out there, you can see them getting underway. So we're finishing off that construction and then are working on the leasing as we speak. We will start next fiscal year the fixed-based operator process, establishing the criteria and the selection process. It probably won't be completed next fiscal year, but we will begin that. As we've told you before, that is always a very contentious process so we are going to run as clean uh, and straightforward and transparent process as we can to, to choose that. Air service development, we talked about that going really well. Some really great trends going uh, on air service, commercial air service improvement. Included in that is airline lease and use negotiations and terminal capacity enhancements. Um, Henry made sure I added that. We have this beautiful new terminal and it's looking great. We're doing really well on new commercial service such that it's getting tied up there already. And so Henry and his staff are gonna have to be strategic and creative about how to fix in uh, all the different operations that are going out there, uh, ordering a new jetway and things like that. So uh, a lot of interesting work. Noise monitoring and nuisance abatement that has peaked up over the last six months as a, an issue at the airport commission. They've created a subcommittee uh, and kind of worked it through that. And so appreciate their help there. And then hopefully, finally, the solar project on the long term parking lot will get it. going to try to do you all for some time. Uh, my office, with uh, Nina and Matt in particular, they support a lot of citywide operations. But in addition, you know, Matt leads up the commercial cannabis permitting and implementation process, which has been a lot of work, but with a lot of help from Taba and Anthony Wagner and Andrew Vermont. Um, he staffs the Neighborhood Improvement Task Force, which brings a lot of different departments together to focus on uh, neighborhood improvement and nuisance issues. Nina supervises the arts program that we contract with the county and has also serves uh, essentially as our public information person. And then she leads all the downtown coordination efforts along with George and his staff uh, for kind of citywide efforts. So we got a lot going on out of our office. Ariel and his shop has a ton on their plate. This is just a snapshot. 
Uh, out of both of our performance reviews, you know, you asked for better monitoring and tracking. Ariel has created a, a database internally and working with the departments on tracking that. And then Pam out of my office has got a comprehensive uh, list on that as well to where I was able to pull a lot of this information off of. So we're getting more management uh, information going there. And uh, Paul, I have one teeny comment I want to make. I've made it to the mayor and, and Mayor Pro Tem. I want to make it a little council. Uh, on SB 35 objective design standards, I think that is a challenge to Santa Barbara's policymakers to find the kinds of objective standards that protect what you want of Santa Barbara. In other words, this is brand new law. There is no case law defining what objective design standards mean. I think you need to feel free to, if not push that limit, at least define that limit so that as part of the litigation process we can figure out how much discretion we still have for the design bodies in the city council. So uh, what I'm saying is it's not a process for you to be passive and relying on staff. It's a process, it's the time to push the limits legally if that's what you want to do. Yes. Can I ask about the process for that? Is that something that we'll have court talks about, or it comes to council? And then how does it? Mr. Buell can answer. Yeah, uh, Council Member Snedden, my my department right now is starting to work on work with the attorney's office on how we define these guidelines and what they mean and what you will ultimately do with them. We're starting with the design board and to get input from them. Ultimately, those will work its way through the planning commission then to the council. Okay. That's that's the plan right now. And, and so if we want to if we want to push things to their limit, at what point would we do that once it comes to council, or should we be involved early on? Or? The, uh, as you're aware from uh, the paper um, and from our earlier discussions in 2018, uh, one of the things we did in my office to try and deal with uh, perhaps inconsistencies in the design bodies, the ABR, HLC, SFDB, was begin staffing with lawyers those design bodies. That's been going on for six, seven months. Uh, you saw in the paper recently that that staffing uh, culminated in a series of trainings uh, around the SB 35 objective design standards, which were done partly with Ms. Ostringer, largely with uh, Ms. Deisty from CD. Those presentations are telling these boards and commissions what they can do. The presentation when Ms. Ostranger makes it to the City Council is going to be the entree for you to tell us what you want to do. Okay? That's the difference. In other words, you, in my mind, in, in, in uh, addressing SB 35, you have discretion and power to take chances that I wouldn't advise an advisory body to, to take. You need to decide what lawsuits you want to take on, not the advisory body. Yeah, that, that was going to be my question. So if we do decide to quote unquote and push the envelope on these design standards, we can expect litigation as a result and the associated costs of that? Uh, probably, but the reason I'm urging the council to be active is that when the record before the court shows a lot of thought by the elected officials, they will be deferential to you. And I, I really think that phrase objective design standards leaves you a lot more room than maybe they thought in Sacramento. And I hope, uh, it, it's been true in the past, is that the development community that works in Santa Barbara loves and respects what Santa Barbara is as well, that I think if we if we approach it in a good faith and trying to have some objective standards, but trying to maintain some quality in Santa Barbara, that they'll, they'll work with us. But, never know. Yes, Judy. So I'm, I'm concerned um, about this. How much of your work is land use and community development related? Just kind of a general ballpark percentage more than two FTEs when you count support staff. I'd have to look at the advisory portion of my budget, but it's a bit over two FTEs. And in response to your concern about enforcement, recall the council gave us two FTEs last year for enforcement. I've hired the investigator. We tried to hire a deputy prosecutor. Uh, 
that recruitment led me to believe that we needed to have that be an assistant high level position to make it work. Uh, so with Paul's authorization, we swapped the Scott Vincent assistant city attorney position. We're recruiting for that as an entry level deputy, relying on Tave Ostringer and John Doimus to advise CD. And we're recruiting for an assistant city prosecutor. At that level, the kinds of applications I'm getting are DAs and assistant U.S. attorneys, which is exactly what I want. So uh, you haven't benefited from your policy decision to fund that extra enforcement yet because I haven't been able to hire the person. And, my, and so my observation on the enforcement is, is I'm glad we're moving forward. I'm not sure if I would prior to prioritize that over the transactional attorneys. You know, uh, at one point in one of our joint meetings, I said we should clone Scott Vincent. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we've lost him, so it's actually mm -hmm. gone the opposite direction. And I know you mentioned uh, this Ostranger and this Drew Boymus, but they're pretty new to the land use law. Irene and I can speak from personal experience. It's a difficult, thorny area, particularly with the barrage we're getting from Sacramento. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear more options as soon as possible in terms of how to beef up that, that unit. Uh, can we do, can we authorize a full-time senior position there? Can we do a recruitment? I mean, these are just ideas, and, I, and I, again, I want you to come back with some options if possible. But this is a department that's really struggling because of the barrage from Sacramento, because of the local economic trends with all the building, all the permits. And uh, it's just getting further and further behind, and a lot of it is because they're relying on uh, legal assistance. And we... You know, heard that the permitting uh, software is coming through, and that's great, but there's a whole bunch of other things. And so my fear is we have several new council members who are never going to be able to push through a project that will get done during their terms because of the backlog. And, and this is something that Santa Barbara, uh, it's, it's the pride of Santa Barbara is our land use, our the beautiful town and the links we go to to preserve this beauty, and it's difficult. And at the same time, we're losing... Um, businesses that want to start here that would be great assets to our city. They bring services and goods that people want to buy. For example, the old, the new coffee shop in, in Old Town Goleta tried to set up shop, I believe, on State Street and gave up, threw their hands up in the air and, and moved to Goleta. And it's, it's the, the star of Old Town Goleta now. So there's several examples of that. I, I wish I had a dollar for every time someone said, I'm not doing business anymore in Santa Barbara. I don't know if it's necessarily true, but I'm going to take it at face value. So to the extent you can prioritize beefing up the land use. Our advisory groups, uh, morale is really down, and these are volunteers doing a lot of work. And uh, it was great getting them an attorney, but. That, that's pretty strong language, saying that their morale is low. And, and I hear you saying that there's a backlog at, at the city attorney's office. It, I, I, you know, I just wanted to give Mr. Kalan a, a chance to respond, but I'm hearing what you're saying, and I, and I think Mr. Kalan is too. Well, uh, Madam Mayor, the, 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 it is true there's a backlog. We've discussed it. Right. It, it, there are about five projects that are stale. Two of them are on the Ordinance Committee for Tuesday. Uh, the next that I'm highly concerned with, and your police are highly concerned with, is the alcohol regulation ordinance for uh, off-sale. And of course, we understand the council's concerns and have scheduled the inclusionary work associated with AUD. The CD staff have done that. I've been supporting that personally. So I'm happy to discuss with the, Mr. Casey what you're raising, Councilmember Dominguez. I do think there's a, a lag here because you, you allocated the additional bodies in our office next year, um, uh, last year rather, I need to see what happens when that body comes before I would ask for any more. Uh, I am happy, though, to be specific with you about the staffing for CD and let the council weigh in on how you want to do that. So I, I can prepare that. In, in regards to the, the language I use being strong, that's my watered-down language. Okay. <laughs> okay. I appreciate the mayor you know, wanting to make sure that... Uh, the tone is right, but that really is the, these groups have feel like they're not getting the training they need, they're not um, getting staff, they're dealing with inexperienced staff. I heard we just lost Danny Ng, one of our, our staff members in the department. We've lost senior level people, and, and that's not your department's fault, but I'm just showing that to show the need for as strong of an attorney unit as we can have for a department that's 
again, because of outside forces, having a hard time. So to the extent you can beef up, you know, above and beyond what you normally should, not below average. That's, um, that's my only point. We have, we have a lot of lawsuits coming out of that department. Um, we have a lot of uh, appeals. So. Okay, and you're about done with the city attorney section. Mr. Friedman? Um, following up on Councilmember Dominguez's points and going back to the presentation, I mean, we're right at budget and we have a shortfall that's projected to come. So, I mean, I think it's easy to say we need to do A, B, and C. So it would be helpful if we're going to ask them to do those types of things and look at where we need to hands is if we understand what we're going to have to cut to make those changes, where it's going to come from. might not even be your department, but I believe it. Mr. Casey is, how do we balance that? Because and if council members are proposing things, I'd also like to hear from council members where they would propose to cut things to pay for the things they want. So, because it's easy to propose, you know, we want this, but it's also mm. it's also hard to make the cuts. So, um, I just want everyone to keep that in mind that we're right at budget. It's not we're not growing revenue to cover the deficit coming. So, if we want to do extra enhancements, we need to be very careful about what we pay for. So, that's all I want to say. And Mr. Casey, if you're looking at that and other things that are going to come up, if you could please um, show us what things we would like to cut. Or not like to cut, but what we would need to cut. I can Keep address, going. I can address uh, that. I, I, I just want it for future. I don't want to address it right now. Madam Mayor, if no. I may, we're, gonna, we're drilling down on some minutia here and you know, some specific policies and departments. We have an entire you know, rest of the budget to, to mm. tee up, and that's what the idea we're scoping today. And we're just kind of daily. I, I think if I think these are all valid debates, no doubt. But I think we could be here all day on any one department if, we, if we're not careful about how we proceed. Let's do keep going, and there'll be a chance for everyone seconds. to. Okay. Go ahead. So one one way is penalty for late permits, and this came up at one of the appeals, and I'm not sure if, if Mr. Buell has that in the works. And then uh, the Paseo Nuevo projects, that's 28 years of free rent to the tune of $7 million we're giving away. Okay, we, we okay, we're, thank you. Work. We're going to move on. Thanks. Uh, Mentioned the new city prosecutor, design review and planning commission bodies. That's new sidewalk vending response. That comes across a lot of different departments. That's new state law that we feel we need to get out ahead of. Uh, they now allow sidewalk vending. We've gone and gotten some of Community development. Tons going on in the community development department. Um, we talk about what we coming with the heat grant. We do human service grants that hits that similar area. We talked about AUD being a priority. The tenant displacement and mobile home, working with Ariel is coming forward. Most of the local coastal plan update we got through, but it's now at the Coastal Commission, and so we're, we're waiting to see the response back from that. Sea level rise, a number of you are on the sea level rise subcommittee. Major effort, uh, kind of came off a very big issue. Low cost visitor accommodation study came out of the LCP. That's kind of a policy issue that the Coastal Commission staff is really pushing on us that doesn't really have an easy answer, and so we're gonna to try to figure out uh, how to address that. We do have the fee study that we'll be bringing forward to as part of the budget. It's a comprehensive fee study looking at the planning and building fees. And there's some sub substantive changes that we're gonna be recommending. Uh, and also a desire to try to get closer to full cost recovery on the planning side, but that's gonna mean some pretty substantial increases on the planning fees that have historically been subsidized by the general fund. So you will be seeing that uh, coming forward. Historic resources design guidelines, I would add that to Ariel's list of kind of what's been on that pending and needs to get going. And I, I think that's kind of the, the fifth one that uh, we've heard from you all and from the community about needing to bring it forward. And then George has been working with the Downtown Economic Vitality Group, architects, uh, uh, property owners, and business owners, looking at the planning and building permit process. They've been meeting, I think, bi-weekly or, or monthly uh, since September after we had that August meeting. Initially, we thought it would be three meetings and we could report back to you all. They've really dug in deep, and they've really wanted to dig in deep. And so George has been there, Andrew Stuffler, the building official, Renee Brooke, the city planner. So it's kind of been an all hands on deck kind of focused working group. And so we'll be bringing recommendations back to you from that group. Some we've already implemented. Uh, some I think we're excited about trying to get to. Kind of ties in with the fee study as well. So I, I think you'll see that reporting back. And we're hoping you got one more meeting. So April, April we'll bring it back. Uh, and then on top of that, the accelerated program. 
Finance Department, uh, Bob and his staff do a great job in the budget preparation. It really is kind of a six month haul to get us through the budget process internally. Um, utility billing system upgrade. And then Bob also has uh, the Solid Waste Division under him. And so mentioning uh, the Clean Santa Barbara program, addressing abandoned waste, illegal dumping encampments, and kind of taking a focus on that. That kind of ties into part of the homeless efforts that we do in trying to address that. Fire Department, Chief Nichols here. Thank you for making it back from San Luis Obispo. We ended up on our oral board helping them out up in San Luis. Uh, you know, he's new, and it's been a while since the department has had a strategic plan, so he's going to lead a department strategic plan. Wildfire protection plan, I know that's a priority for you all. Uh, it's a priority for us as well, and we're pursuing grant opportunities to fund that. He assures me that we're going to get a grant, so... Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's hopeful. You know, he's got his finger on the pulse about what's going on statewide. It's clearly an issue. We are an area at risk. Um, you got to hope the state realizes that and uh, is able to provide us with the money to get that going, which would be really uh, good and important. We have the Fire Station 7 project. That's the one up by Sheffield Reservoir. Um, we've been trying to rebuild that station. It's in need, plus you've got the Forest Service. It's in the trailer next to it. Uh, we were thinking about building it down on the corner at Sheffield Reservoir where the old treatment plant building is, but that's turning out to be quite expensive, and so we're back kind of on the existing site. So working with the architect and trying to figure that one out. Uh, and then so a couple regional issues that are pretty big. The ambulance contract is up. The county manages the ambulance contract, but we play an important role in that. So the chief will be involved uh, in that conversation, as well as a regional fire dispatch evaluation. The county is looking at going to a regional fire dispatch kind of separating it from the uh, police and sheriff dispatch system. So we're looking at that. Um, I think we're going to give a presentation to you in the next couple months just to kind of let you know the board's had a couple presentations, so we want to inform you all about that. Um, interested seems to work really well in Ventura. Uh, I'm withholding judgment until I see a better analysis. I want to know financially, is it a wash for us? If it's a wash and provides better services to the community, seems like a great idea. Uh, if it's not a wash and costs us an extra million dollars a year, uh, shoot, you know, that gives me a twitch. So you know, we'll see. Those are just kind of two extreme examples, but I'm uh, certainly interested in studying that. Library department, Jessica continues to do great work with her staff out there. The one thing she really wanted me to highlight to you was the student success initiative. And that's where they're trying to get into the school district. And every student that has a student ID card essentially works as a library card. Is that right, Jessica? And so that, that gets them the access, not only to all the books, but all the digital media that we do. One of the things that people don't realize is that Santa Barbara Library is really a leader on digital media uh, services that a lot of other libraries don't have. And so that's a real big initiative of trying to, to get into the school to make that available to them. County Library Agreement, we continue to work on the struggle. Uh, solving in Buellton, they're going to move into a different district with Galita. That leaves us with Montecito and Carpinteria. How much is Carpentry going to be able to fund to support their library? It's been a struggle. The admin fee is something we're going to have to look at again, so you'll, you'll hear more about that. The library plaza is going along well. The final design is going along great. The library foundation is working on fundraising. It's still kind of in the early stages. I think they're waiting to see the final design to kind of really get going to have something to show. Uh, but you all put seed money into that, the $500,000 to kind of get that going is kind of a challenge to the foundation to go fundraise for that, so hopefully that works. And then, uh, oh, the Friends of Library Communications Plan. If you recall last year, uh, you all, as part of the budget process, said do a better job of outreaching to the different uh, Friends groups. And so Jessica has done that. She's got a, kind of a communications plan. She'll report that back to you uh, this coming year. And then we're going to try to put in an elevator uh, to get a new ADA accessible elevator down to all levels, all three levels of the library that we don't have. Right now it's looking like it's going to go right in the middle of the library. So it'll be a disruptive project, but it'll be a good project in the end. So keep an eye on that. Parks and Recreation. Title 15 amendments. Title 15 is kind of the Parks and Recreation portion of the zoning ordinance. And so Jill and you all have been talking about doing some changes that just came up about playgrounds and trying to restrict uh, adults from loitering near playgrounds who don't have children and things like that. And so looking at a few package of amendments there. Uh, trying to do a special event ordinance. They're also very involved in the sidewalk vending discussion. Old Spanish days, their lease is coming up uh, down at Pershing Park. I think that's what you're referencing, Jill. Um, 
it's really complicated. Uh, old Spanish days owns a square in the middle of the baseball diamond at Pershing Park. And in exchange, we let them use the old carriage house museum, and then you have a city college joint use agreement on top of that as well. So their lease is coming up. Do we want to try to resolve that once and for all? Um, always hard and tricky, so we'll see. Uh, Cabrillo Pavilion, we need to wrap that up and get it open. We are excited to getting it open. I think October is the shooting forward date. So that's good. Bob talked about the financial shortfall, though, so we will have to find a way to, to finish up paying that. We'll bring that to you. Cameron in Jill's shop, as well as George and Renee and Andrew Steffler, are working on the stormwater permit uh, guidelines. You hear a lot from the architects and engineering community about how difficult of an ordinance that is to work with. Uh, to do stormwater improvements as part of your development. It's a permit that we got issued from the Regional Water Quality Control Board, so it's nothing you all can change. The Regional Water Quality <coughs> Control Board loves us. We, they think we have the gold standard of the permit. It's the highest, best, uh, most aggressive stormwater management ordinance that you have, and your development community hates it. They find it very difficult and restrictive and inflexible and hard to work with. And so uh, I believe that the mayor and Randy had called a group together and they've been working with city staff uh, with some of those engineers and architects to see if we can amend the ordinance as we go back to the Regional Water Quality Control Board. So we're working with that, having really good conversations. They're being very constructive and giving ideas. And so hopefully we can take a package back to the Regional Water Control Board that meets everyone's needs. And then you've been seeing a lot of the park designs and plans, Bonnet Park, Dwight Murphy, Ortega, Franceschi House will be coming up, and a lot of capital projects. Thousand Steps doing some initial work on trying to reopen Thousand Steps. The West Beach Splash Playground is coming forward, and a lot of other stuff. Police Department, you could have a big long list of police, but Lori's going to come and give you a presentation uh, in the next couple weeks or so, so I'm going to not try to steal her thunder. Certainly the police building, uh, they're intimately involved in that selection process. Ariel just mentioned the off-sale deemed approved alcohol ordinance <coughs> that we had ready to go. And then the focus that she'll talk about at her uh, presentation is recruitment and retention. Um, continuing just to struggle with the nationwide struggle about keeping positions filled and, and getting people recruited and, and filling those vacancies. And so that's a focus of hers. She has a special section going now, staffed up, focused solely on, on recruitment and stuff. She'll talk about more about that. Public Works, uh, bridge reconstruction program. <coughs> we are really fortunate to be able to get so many bridges done with this federal bridge program, which is like an 89%, 90% matching program. Uh, so it's been very effective. You can continue to see us uh, moving forward and picking up bridges as we go. Las Positas Multi-Use Path, major grant-funded project. Uh, Again, just not to toot her own horn, but Rebecca and her staff have been so successful at getting these active transportation planning grants uh, to the jealousness of the rest of the state <laughs> on a per capita basis. I think we are the highest per capita recipient of these grants. And so the Las Positas Multi-Use Path is one of those. Uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrade. Uh, so you have a wastewater treatment plant that runs seven days, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, <coughs> two weeks out of the year, you know, nonstop and yet you're constantly having to upgrade and maintain it. Um, they just are in the process right now, and Rebecca might want to fill it in, it's a really big deal, but it's kind of techy, but we, we just flipped the switch on a major, ah, do it Rebecca, you're so much better. And so we've been working for, um, actually we figured out, we started this project nine years ago. Um, it's a water quality project at the wastewater plant. It is not regulatory driven, it's above and beyond. It's a project to, improve and increase the uh, degree of treatment that we provide for the water we trace, treat there by uh, extending the amount of time that it's under digestion by the microorganisms that, that digest and eat the waste, allowing it to be incorporated into their bodies and they can be settled out, recirculated, creating a, a, an ecosystem of microorganisms. They, uh, the plant has been working on this. It's, they had to reconfigure it. It's really exciting. Can't wait to show people who are interested. Um, but they have essentially, the organisms used to live for about a day, and now we're trying to extend it out to about 10 days because that will create, create much better treated waste, much clearer waste, more easily filtered waste for recycled water and any future needs. And then one of the things I'm really excited about is that um, 
an added benefit is that it helps address community contaminants of emerging concern like endocrine disruptors and pharmaceuticals. Even though we don't have standards for those, we know we won't, don't want them in the environment, so we're thrilled that we're going to have that added bonus with this, this treatment upgrade. So very exciting. And as uh, Mr. Casey said, we started that conversion process on Tuesday. I've been checking in recently, and it's looking good. Yeah. yeah. So it's one of those behind-the-scenes things, but they've had to do the construction while still maintaining an optical plant. And so a uh, very complicated construction project that has gone very well. So it's exciting to see that. What's the overall cost, do you think, at the end of the day? The overall cost for the treatment project was right about $30 million. Um, a, a good portion of that was things that would have needed to be done anyway. Some of the infrastructure that was replaced is original to a plant, so probably 40 years old. And it's basically the lungs of the plant, the blowers. Um, and we've also been able to automate, so our controls there are so much better, really much better. And for a complete wastewater um, nerd, it, it, the treatment process smells different now. Tours are available. <laughs> 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 Funk Zone Parking Study, Rebecca Staff has been working with the Funk Zone, kind of looking at the available parking resources, and we'll continue to work with that uh, part of town. Mission Canyon Bridge, community planning, we've stayed for the whole meeting, so this is the one comment on Mission Canyon Bridge. Um, we're, we're just, we're in the planning stages of getting more information, exactly, and so you're right, there's no imminent construction coming up in that regard, there's a lot of community outreach and dialogue that will need to occur. And then Daily Vera Plaza, we're actually very excited about working on that. And then Waterfront, uh, Scott and his staff have quite a bit going on. They're going to be moving towards sub-metering sub all the electrical and all the slips. And the, the physical work is just about done, and they're getting ready to kind of transition over. And so that's good in the sense that if you had a slip uh, out there or you had a boat or whatever, you just paid a kind of flat monthly fee, and that included your electrical costs. So there was no incentive for conservation. And so now going to submetering, <laughs> sub everyone's going to have their own uh, electric bill, and so have kind of a direct consequence for their usage on those slips. And so uh, we think that's the good environmental thing to do. We're not sure all the slip holders will agree when they start getting their bills, so we'll see. Sternsport pile management, that's just continuing. Oh, another potential sticky wicket. Uh, down on the waterfront parking lots, uh, there are a number of lighted and stored vehicles that just take up spaces day after day down there. Uh, some that are parking their vehicle down there, even though they might live uh, somewhere else in the city, just because it's a place to park a car for three days and not have to worry about it. Or some that are essentially used as storage vehicles and such. And so there's quite a bit. So Scott and the staff are going to take that issue on and try to delicately address it. It's going to be a sensitive issue because you're going to rub some people the wrong way as part of that process. So I think it's the right thing for them to be tackling, but you might be hearing more about it. So we'll see. Um, sea level rise, Carl Freiberg in particular out of Scott's staff is really knowledgeable on sea level, sea level rise and beach erosion type stuff, and so his participation has been great. We continue to work with the Corps and get the uh, semi-annual dredging done, keep the harbor open, super important, and we do work on that. And cruise ships, we're going to be up to 28 cruise ships in FY20. I think we dropped down to 21 this last fiscal year, but uh, right now on the planning calendar for that, we have about 28 stops uh, coming in. We think that's kind of around a sweet spot. It kind of works. It's a good jolt in the arm for uh, some of the local tourism industry uh, commercial enterprises. Uh, Scott and the chamber and their staff do a really nice job of laying out a really good welcome mat. So I think it's, it's found kind of a, a nice spot here and able to manage it pretty well. So that's just a real quick rough quick. We're happy to answer any questions on this or anything else on the budget. Oh, the calendar. If you don't mind, let me just go to the calendar really quick. Um, so. Right now, departments are putting together their budget presentations for me, and then I'm reviewing them. We then work with the finance staff to package it all together and do final balancing not until next month. And then in April, I re uh, release the draft plan for you and the public to consider. And then you have a number of meetings uh, from May into early June. I apologize in advance. It's a lot of time and effort for you to review all the budgets and budget meetings that we get put on your calendar, but it's kind of one of the major things that we do. And then we'll adopt the budget. Is there another slide there, Bob? Exactly. By late June, we do the budget adoption. For those that are relatively new, how it works um, is we kind of go department by department. We package departments together and bring those to you. As you're reviewing those 
uh, departments. If you have questions or changes that you want to make, we'd like to hear them at those department hearings. It gives us time to kind of go back. And then in early June, we package all those recommendations you had together and come back to you with kind of a final budget balancing decision making process. Such as Mr. Friedman said, if you've added, you know, $700,000 worth of new spending and, and new positions and you came in with just a barely balanced budget, then we're going to have to find some ways to offset that and what would those reductions look like. And so that's the conversation of final direction we would need from you in early June as you go through that process. Uh, I will say we don't have the final numbers, but as Bob kind of mentioned, we're probably looking, give or take, in the $400,000 deficit mode of what uh, we're going to have to balance internally before I submit something to you. Uh, out of a $140 million budget, we can handle that. We'll, we'll find a way to do it. But it just means we're kind of skimping. You're not going to see me proposing a lot of new initiatives in the budget because there just isn't the resources there for that. And so anything new that we will add, we're going to have to figure out um, how to do I'll start with a question. Um, so we, I know we've hired uh, Liliana and Cenas in the fire department to help us with Spanish language outreach. It's disaster preparedness and emergency response, right? And um, we have talked about uh, if she might do some um, organizing of some of our employees or are bilingual and they get bilingual pay and what what would the would we need more in the budget to like for instance make our agendas bilingual or we're evaluating that now that's what i mentioned the bilingual communications plan that we'll bring to council uh, okay so that's part of the plan absolutely mm -hmm. yep yep so it, it's looking at those all those types of issues that you've uh, been talking about over the past year we're going to see what we can do see what financial impacts there are or aren't and see what we can present to you so coming shortly okay yeah and no. Liliana is great and she's already done a really great job uh, kind of jump starting that bilingual outreach to Spanish speaking community okay and then on on my list I, I think I've talked about it before is um, the possibility of a of another park ranger mm -hmm. to help with public safety in the parks unless there's a plan and there's if, if you think volunteers would work or something like the red shirts or or uniformed officers if that's part of their regular patrol is to cruise through the parks i just have a concern and wanted to if we're looking at at the budget um i, I assume a park ranger is less expensive than a than a police officer yes yes okay but but still money <laughs> and and are park rangers under parks or under police? Okay, they're under the parks. Okay. And then I, I just want to put in a good word for the rental housing mediation program. I refer someone there uh, every couple of weeks. It's programmed in my phone. And um, evictions, uh, I've had neighbors that were burned out. You know, there was a fire and, and all those services were Mr. Buell really People adore that program, and I think there's only two employees in there. So just, if, if I don't want to see any money cut from rental housing mediation, and um, it's just so well used, especially in our lower income neighborhoods where people are displaced. So there's my list. Uh, Mr. Rouse? Yeah, I just want to make a comment, because when we do these budget things, we tend to look at things, departments and whatnot, as liabilities and expenditures, and really, our greatest revenue is our cash day is, is Santa Barbara visiting serving visitor serving services or what count but what makes that happen are having really good public safety departments really good public works department really fine parks and recreation department so when I first got on the council we had had a lot of cuts to staff we didn't have as many police officers we were talking about closing a couple of fire stations we always nailed parks and rec as the easiest the low hanging fruit budget wise and I think the best way to, because we've talked about ideas for generating more revenue, the best way we can do that, I think, is to support staff going forward and make, make let them do their job to the best ability that they can to make the aesthetic work here. Along with our improvements and measure C and the things that we're doing, those are going to be revenue generators in the end. It might take some patience and it's going to be, we're going to have to watch ourselves fiscally. But I really think that the plan is in place. I think the, the, the components are in place, I think it's up to council to be supportive and try to move forward rather than try to reinvent the wheel and work with staff to get this done and get Santa Barbara 
back to where we think it should be in terms of all things public safety and aesthetically. Very good. Awesome. Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you. Um, I didn't see here anything about possibly creating an app to uh, streamline reporting services to the city. Yeah, that was, that, we call that the constituent relationship management application. Oh, that's what that Yeah, is. so that, and you all gave us direction. We're doing the analysis of that this fiscal year uh, with the hopes of maybe moving towards something next fiscal year. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Is that it? Very good, thank you. Ms. Smith? Uh, first I have a question, but then a comment. But, um, and maybe we get more into this in public works, but to Ms. Crawford's budget, I just had some questions about that, the budgeting over time. Do you have a copy of that? Yeah, maybe but I'm just looking to Rebecca, she might wanna. Oh, yeah. so I'm just, so the current year was budgeted by 100,000, and that was for um, the initial study. And then the approved amounts, the future needs, are these, these are just placeholders, or these are? So I'm looking at the um, Mission Canyon Bridge yep. Capital Improvement Program sheet, and the current year is um, grant funded and 100,000 is coming as match money required. So we, we get, um, we need to provide some match money for that. Um, and that's what the, the budgeting there is, um, and it's for project management essentially. And, and that's for if we accept the project as it comes? This is for the work for the design for the design work that's going on right now. And, and I want to be really clear. There is no project right now. The design work is the environmental analysis and it, it, the, the studies of what could and might happen there. But additionally to that, um, and we, we're going to do some analysis of it, the existing sidewalk is um, getting more and more rickety. So we, we, you know, we're clear that we need to make at some point in time, we'll need to make modifications to that. This process will be great in having a funded process that will allow us to decide what we do or don't want to do there, but allow us to do it in a way that we are well planned and ready to go forward at such time. And, and so these that are budgeted are placeholders for if the project continues on that scale? That's correct. Or, okay. That's, that's correct. And this, this isn't actually a budget, it's a plan. It's out of our capital improvement program. Okay. So uh, until it's adopted by you at council, it doesn't become a budget. Okay. And yeah. there is a public hearing on this in April. Public outreach. Public outreach, right. Okay. Yeah. And I, I don't have the date. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Because it looks like a budget. It does. And, yeah. Okay. And then um, I just want to, for, for comments, just along yeah, with that with public safety, and, and um, if we can be looking at grants or other funding opportunities for just resilience in general and fire prevention and what we can be doing on the preventative side of either slow moving disasters like sea level rise, climate change, or acute disasters, but I just think um, there's always the immediate need of, of what we're spending right now for what's happening right now, but I mean, I, I don't know at what point we start putting that in motion, but I, and I, I know you've heard, I feel like you've definitely noted it and will be, it'll be coming back to council, but just to reiterate that, that I think it's time to really the long range planning for prevention of some of these things. It will be far more expensive if we if we don't start now preventatively. But um, I haven't been going to those meetings, but if, if there's a motion and a recommendation coming out of the group mm -hmm. to the city council or to staff, then this, that'd this, be a good way to start the conversation. Oh yes, and this is more uh, an overarching because it's across departments. I mean, I think in fire, in fire prevention, that's oh, why I'm going to come out of sea level rise. You know, just in, in general, I think because it just under the umbrella of climate change, where there are extreme conditions, um, emergency planning that we've planned so well for acute events, um, but just I'm not sure it's in the budget, these longer term impacts. So it's just an overarching comment, mm -hmm. not really a, a, a motion for a particular budget item, but just to start looking at the longer range on that. Okay. On this side then, Mr. Um, Dominguez, go ahead. Yes, I wanted to ask a question about the police department and our homelessness. You know, I mentioned community development and maybe trying to do something more with the homeless manager, but what is the cost to the city in terms of the homeless problem? It seems like it's increasing. We've been getting more and more constituent complaints. There's more and more people camping out in the field. Is this something that our chief might be able to weigh in on? I mean, she might be able to answer it better later, but look, go ahead. 
Mayor and Council. Um, <laughs> I had a mouthful in the back. Um, <clears throat> I was going to say, obviously, it's a complex issue that touches a lot of our departments, and I know community development had some numbers as far as costs. But directly for us, there's been some workload increases that have culminated in um, more radio calls, meaning less time available for other things. So um, we allocate a, a bunch of resources to our restorative efforts. Um, we end up responding now a lot because of the complaints from the community. A lot of the issues, for many different reasons, aren't enforcement opportunities for us to control or reduce. Um, we end up doing what we can to reduce the complaint, which a lot, of, a lot of times is trash on scene. We work with Public Works as well as community development on some of the camp cleanups. Um, those numbers have increased, therefore the costs have increased, um, and we try to squeeze in what we do within our current budget. Um, I don't know that that answered it, at least from my perspective, but as comprehensively as you wished. Yeah, I just wanted to know if there's any stats or any even just personal observations you have that reflect is the homeless problem growing in terms of the impact it has on your department, and I think you've answered it. And if, if you can bring more, uh, I guess, quantifiable, quantifiable data when you're coming back to us in a couple months, that would be great. Yes, it, and just off the top of my head, I know um, it's one of those hard things to categorize in radio calls. They get... Um, formatted from a dispatcher that takes in the information from the public, um, but of the flags that are a call, uh, that are, I should say, of the calls that are flagged, um, we saw a jump from 6% to 12% over the last year. Um, it averages out to 19 and a half radio calls per day for us, and those are probably sorely underestimated. Those are just, again, the calls that get flagged as homeless. Related. Again, I'd like to add to, to what Paul shared earlier, uh, along with the City Administrator's Office, we're going to be putting together a comprehensive package of what is what is happening on the streets as far as we can tell. Back in January, there was a, a countywide point in time count that took place, and we'll yes. be able to share yeah. information uh, with regards to that, so that's really objective. And uh, so we're working with Home for Good on that. They were essentially the overseers of that process countywide. And we have started to pull the numbers together and it, one thing is to what we do to respond to homelessness and the other thing is what we're doing beyond so the, the heat plant for example that will show up as two million dollars and that will be a significant increase over what we've seen in in previous years but we'll be able to break that out so that you can see you know how we're how we're putting the parts and pieces together to address the problem we have had a very wet and very cold winter and the what you've seen more often also is uh, the Freedom Warming Centers opening up. Uh, next week, you're going to see a request from Freedom, Freedom Warming Centers asking for additional money from the city. Staff is supportive of that, and we'll see what you decide when that comes before you. Uh, but when we have weather like we do, the, the prevalence, individuals aren't going to camp out in a park or even maybe not even a freeway uh, right of way or the railroad right of way. And so it's bringing people into areas where there's structured um, shelter where they don't get wet, cold, and ultimately possibly get sick and, or pass away. And so... If, if I could just one anecdote, and I know Brandy will hate me, he hates anecdotes. <laughs> one, we all know it's hard. Um, it's a tough issue. East Cayley Street, zero block of East Cayley Street. A year ago, we were getting a ton of complaints about people who were just stuck on East Cayley Street, disruptive, blocking the sidewalk, um, unsightly. We had police going by there all the time, just couldn't get them to budge. Um, and Lori, Lori, you might know the story better than I do about the, I don't want to name the name, yes. but the individual on East Cayley Street, I forget if it was restorative who finally got him or if it was a cottage that he finally turned around. But, um, so in this particular scenario, we had 138 radio calls in three months to East Haley, particularly surrounding this one individual who was in a wheelchair and uh, clearly had some alcohol dependency issues. He w it was one that we had a difficult time using the enforcement on hand. Uh, we came to council and discussed that problem and ended up uh, extending the sit-lie ordinance to that 
part of East Haley, um, which subsequently gave us some tools to use our enforcement techniques, and uh, which ended up <coughs> making uh, warrants that allowed us to book the individual. And because there were so many in, in different courts that the individual basically got some clarity after being in jail for a week, and he asked for help from our restorative officers. Because we had developed a preliminary relationship with Cottage Hospital, we reached out to them, and they came and interviewed the inter individual while he was still in jail for many days after that, and they accepted him into one of their programs. And uh, let's see, a couple weeks ago, it was about 50 days that an that individual had been in care. He got all the necessary paperwork that he needed for Social Security. He was being interviewed by housing and was super close to getting it. He was going to daily counseling. He's not in his wheelchair. He's smiling and engaging in a way that he had never done. So that is, in essence, our restorative project or, or our unit in particular. It's being there when the individual has that moment of clarity that a lot of times we can't enforce, but very effective because that individual was ready for it. So it's hard and takes time. Home for Good hopefully is providing that and then sitting that as well with the other resources to try to get some success stories. Other then, questions about homelessness? And, and that's, uh, to me, the reason I wanted to, to bring that up is public safety is, what is it as a percentage of our budget? Between police and fire, it's 53%. So, and to the extent that homeless, uh, People are generating calls, and uh, it's not only obviously the uh, impact on our budget, but it's, it's for their public health and their safety. You know, as, as this anecdote indicated, this, this man was wheelchair bound, and now he's not. So it was a great impact on his life, and then there's the public health and public cost to it. So this is an area where perhaps we do incur costs in the short term, but it pays dividends. How much do those 130 service calls cost to this one person? We've had 60 or 70 service calls to Ortega Park in the last couple of months. How much is that costing that we could reinvest into our children, into our parks? So it, it does make sense for a big budget line item like this, and since it's such a big part of that police department's budget, to really be innovative and try things. And so more money up front on homelessness. Possibly if there's ideas that the, that the PD, but I want them to feel like we're encouraging them to come back to us in, in March, April, May, and June with ideas. I don't want them to think that they hear from us, oh, don't come with any ideas. We're going to just shut you down because we don't have money. And, and, and one response to that is that that's a lot of what the heat grant is, though. The heat yeah. grant was kind of a wish list that we were able to come up with and meet with our partners. And so we got two million bucks into that. So we're excited to see how effective that is. And there is going to be a heat, too. Um, so, but I hear. Any other areas? Madam Mayor, the, the, I, I need to, to add into this discussion. We, we, we've spent a lot of time as staff thinking about homelessness, and it, it divides up into three pieces. You have people, the behavior of the people, and their stuff. Uh, the councils effectively dealt with uh, the behavior of the people with things like aggressive panhandling, campaign, and sit live. Um, there's nothing we can do about the people. Uh, so that leaves their stuff. And the, the, the next place to look is what can we do to limit the amount of possessions or garbage, depending uh, that people have, because the complaints I see are about all the accumulated stuff. We have strategies, it's not the time to talk about those, but we are thinking about it continuously. We might bring some of those forward in April. When it's that laundry list, plus urinating in public, mm -hmm. theft, That's they're behavior. stealing truck batteries, fires, they, someone died under a culvert under the 101. I, I wrote an ordinance forbidding. The last week, so it's, it's a long laundry list of money we're going to save. Madam Mayor, Council Member Dominguez, we, we've addressed uh, homelessness, the council has steadily, uh, at least since I've been here, one of the first things we did was an ordinance that forbade urinating or defecating in public because the DA wasn't taking our cases, so we did their own. I, I, it, it might be useful uh, to produce a catalog of the actions the council's taken in the last five years. But I really uh, honestly think it's helpful to think about people, their behavior, and their stuff. Um, Thanks for that clarification. 
Ms. Kornman, you're, well, you have the floor. Okay. Mr. Um, Friedman, take us home. Um, I'll just say uh, kind of where Randy's at on, the Councilman Rouse is on this, is we have a budget. Um, we need to make sure that we're being creative to solve these problems that Councilman Dominguez has raised. I think he's absolutely right. The more you can do them up front. Um, but uh, anything that we add, I want to understand what the trade-off is going to be for that. So um, for the most part, I think we're on the right track here. Uh, we have a lot, as we saw what we're doing, a lot of different things. We have a lot of long-term issues with sea level rise that we start, we need to start planning for. We talked about this plan that Council Member Stem, we talked about it in, in, um, in the subcommittee about when do we start putting money away for some of these big infrastructure needs we're going to have. Um, but overall, I think just we'll come back and we'll give feedback and I do encourage, I agree with Council Member Dominguez, bring creative ideas to solve the solutions. I don't think it's, we're going to shut you down, but we do have to pay for it, even if we have a short-term cost up front that would save us money. Um, we just have to find a way to pay for it. So I uh, want everyone to keep that in mind. Oh, go ahead. I have a suggestion. I, I know we've talked about um, this is Santa Barbara and what they're doing to bring more of the film and television industry to produce here. Um, one, one thing that is hitting is that how much they're doing internationally. So I know China and a lot of the Asian markets, they, they're producing features and, and TV shows that have $100 million budgets or more. So if we could get some of those studios to produce shows here in Santa Barbara somehow by making it more attractive for them, that could help us generate a lot more revenue. Just a Good question. Uh, Visit Santa Barbara comes to you all every year with kind of an annual update within the next month. They'll be in front of council, so that would be a good opportunity to raise that suggestion. We've already got the script. City Council. You can get up and dance. You can. <laughs> council Member Gutierrez, you can send an email to Kathy Janega Dykes now, and then up. she'll be prepared to present something. So, uh, when what's the next thing that's going to happen on budget? You you change the slide. Oh, I did. Just so, go back one slide. Uh, Release the draft budget. Two months, <laughs> three months. We we grind it out internally. I grind it out with departments. Um, do thorough reviews of all that, and then early April we release the meeting. Meeting. Because then we'll be at council on April twenty sixth. Yes, sorry. <laughs> okay. So you'll you'll see the draft budget in, in mid April. And we'll have a few of these presentations in the meantime that we've been talking about that we And we'll be adjourning and we have a finance committee meeting and ordinance on yes. Tuesday. Yeah. So and if any of you want an agenda review, I've got draft agendas. We'll do it right now. Meeting adjourned.